Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 23rd meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I please remind everyone to make sure their mobile phones are on silent? There have been no apologies received, and I'd like to welcome Claudia Beamish from the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, who is acting as a reporter. I'd like to turn to agenda item one, which is evidence on the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill. This is the third evidence session that we have taken, and there will be two panels. On the first panel, I'd like to welcome Andrew Bauer, the Deputy Director of Policy NFU Scotland, Peter Peacock, Policy Director Community Land Scotland, John Hollingdale, Chief Executive Community Woodlands Association, and Anne Gray, the Senior Policy Officer for Land Use Environment, Scottish Lands and Estates. We have uh, split this session down into various themed areas, and the first theme we are going to look at will be led by John Finney. Before I ask him to, to lead off, could I just ask uh, those giving evidence that if they'd like to speak to try and catch my eye, and I will bring them in, um, it might not be possible to get everyone in on every theme, but I, I will do the best I can. Uh, it really depends on how long you answer or, or give your evidence for. So, John, would you like to kick off, please? Thank you. Good morning, Colonel. I'd like your comments, please, on the structure of the bill, um, the ease of uh, comprehension about it, and whether any improvements could be made, particularly interested in broadening the ownership of forests. Who'd like to go first? John, you, you look say you're going to lead off. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think in general terms, we were happy with the structure and the comprehension. There's one particular section I think we'll get onto later around sort of sections 9 to 15 where the, the language causes quite a lot of confusion, but I kind of gather that that's going to be a particular debate uh, topic. I think the, perhaps the, the interesting thing for, for many respondents was what the bill doesn't say, and that it doesn't have any detail on um, the future arrangements for the management of forestry in Scotland, and that's all kind of away in the policy memorandum. And that was a particular focus of a lot of responses in the original consultation. Um, I, I think we understand the technical reasons that it isn't in the bill, but nonetheless, we feel there's a great deal of concern about the structure and also the extent to which the future structure is set. So one of the suggestions that's been made um, by Community Land Scotland, their cells and so on, is that there should be a, a statement. The bill, the bill should require ministers to make a statement about the future arrangements um, to make sure that they are clear and that any future change to those management arrangements itself ought to be something that's a matter for sort of parliamentary scrutiny rather than simply something that could be changed you know, internally without any further reference to external stakeholders or indeed parliament. Anne, do you want to come in on that? Um, yes, if, if I could. I think we certainly got a number of concerns around the lack of definitions in, in the bill. Um, it seems fairly loosely drafted to us and, and needs um, tied down a lot more in, in some areas. Um, we're also slightly concerned, it's a long-standing issue we, we've had with the sort of trend towards enabling legislation, framework legislation, and then an awful lot left to... to regulation to secondary legislation. So some concerns around that that I maybe pick up um, as, as we go through the evidence session. Um, uh, uh, to echo John, John's points though, we, I have had um, a lot of members concerned about the, um, the, the, the change in, uh, to, to forestry being managed as a, as a division of, or the forestry authority moving to a division of um, Scottish Government and then the Executive Agency, which is also directly controlled by Scottish We'll ministers. definitely be coming on to that yeah, later, so yeah. that, that will definitely be picked up on. Okay. Peter, do you want to come in on yeah. that? Um, I suppose that the, one of the ways you can look at this bill is just a technical bill to, to transfer past arrangements into the new devolved arrangements. So at that level, I don't think it's overly complicated or difficult to follow. It's um, apart from the one bit that John uh, mentioned about the the difference between forest land and other land. 
or non-forest land, as I think the Community Woodlands Association have said. I think I found that quite confusing to work out that you're calling other land, which is not forest land, but potentially you're still calling it forest land. And I think for the layperson over time out there, it's very difficult to reconcile what is forest land and what's not. So I think that could be tidied up. That's a, I think that's more a drafting matter than it's something fundamental to the structure of the bill. Peter, um, uh, sorry, I don't want to stop everyone every time, but a lot of these facts will be coming up. So okay, that's, uh, fine. That, that's yeah. definitely one. That's fine. And, and I know the deputy convener is getting, okay. uh, getting a chance to quiz okay. you on that. Well, in which case, I'll shut up at that point. <laughs> John, do you want to develop the... the, the yes, indeed. Well, uh, another issue that's been expressed is, is the, uh, the concern about uh, potential loss of expertise. I don't know if the panel would like to comment on that. Anne, do you want to go on that? Yeah, uh, that's, um, that's certainly uh, one of our concerns in, in, in terms of this issue of uh, uh, change in the way that forestry will be managed. I think our members are concerned that if... Um, the authority in particular becomes a division of government that we get ministerial churn and that's completely acceptable and understandable but at the upper levels of the civil service we tend to see quite a lot of churn as well and forestry is a long-term industry obviously um, you, your, your crop cycle if it's commercial forestry is at least 35 40 years and it benefits from long-term expertise, not only at the lower practical levels, but at the upper levels as well. Um, John. Just briefly, I mean, forestry, like a lot of land-based industries, has a kind of demographic problem, right? aging workforce that I probably ought to include myself in, and a recruitment problem. It's difficult to get people to come into to land-based industries. I'm sure this is, you know, agriculture feels the same. Um, and we feel, and, and you know, the impending exit from the EU is not going to help with this as well, I think. One bright area currently is that forestry has been quite successful at recruiting kind of mid-career changers, people who come in with a great many skills, often very useful skills from previous careers, and coming into the Forestry Commission, the authority part, and then moving on to, to FE or into the private sector as a develop and that's, to my mind, one successful career development path that is going to be lost or potentially will be lost because they won't be coming that way into the division, I think, unless it has a very clear identity as a forestry division. And potentially, one, one of the suggestions is that it has a chief forestry officer and it has a very clear forest identity to make sure that it is seen by people as being kind of really fixed to the industry rather than simply the part of Scottish Government that administers forestry grants. Hey, sorry, I think uh, Jamie wants to come in slightly on that, if I, I may, maybe to develop that theme a bit, and I think John wants to push it a bit more, I think. Jamie. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, panel. Uh, just to pick up on some of the points we made about expertise, um, and churn of staff. So obviously the civil service works in quite a different way to how the Forestry Commission currently works, um, in the, you know, in the way that people move around the business internally. Um, what, what, is the, what, is, what is the evidence to suggest that, that there may be expertise lost if these functions are brought into the Scottish Government and the civil service? Uh, you know, is there any sus suspected changes to recruitment processes, to the way people move around into departments from one part of the government to another. I, 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 hear the, I hear the concerns, but I don't hear any evidence to suggest that there are reasons for the concerns, if you see what I mean. Anne? Um, yeah, if I might come back in. I, I think we do see in the civil service that there, there's certainly been a culture that at the upper levels people are... Um, uh, generalists, you know, they, they can move from justice to housing to forestry to ag and, and so on. And um, as long as they, they um, have some some core skills around um, uh, around running those departments and policy analysis and strategy, you know, strategic skills, then they can move on. And um, I don't I don't want to say that's um, not a valuable thing. I, I think it I think it is. Um, but I think, particularly in the case of forestry, there's, there's just a concern that forestry is such a long-term industry, um, and there's 
there's such a benefit to people with very long-term memories in, in forestry and that have been around for, for a length of time. Um, so I, I can't offer you much more than that, but I, but I think that's a fairly solid reason to have a careful think about the way things are going to be. Okay, I'm going to let Peter come in, and then, if I may, I'd like to come back to, to John, and then Gail would like to come in, I think. Peter? I, I don't think, to answer Mr Green's point, I don't think I've got any evidence to offer you on this, but I've got evidence of the fear that this might happen, because that's where people are anxious, that they, what would happen. And it's as I think John Hollandale has said, that it's, it comes from taking the Forestry Commission, which is a very distinct organisation, with a very good reputation and, you know, highly regarded for the expertise it's got and the way it addresses policy and the way it advises ministers and so on and does that very successfully and has done over a long period of time. The worry is that as, if it comes in or as it comes into the, the mainstream civil service, that gets diluted, as um, has been referred to by Anne Gray, that the, 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 the opportunity for transfers be within the civil service perhaps, perhaps becomes easier and that way you might lose some expertise or you bring other people in who have got to learn the job in a way that they wouldn't do in quite the same way in the Forestry Commission, which tends to be more self-contained. So I think that's where the worries come from. And to keep the Forestry Commission would provide reassurance. Now, having said that, the way that we've come at this in our, in our evidence is that people made representations about that during the consultation phase on the bill. The government saw all of that and they have still continued to propose what they were proposing. So I take that as more or less if I put it this way, subject to Parliament's approval, clearly, as a bit of a done deal from the government's point of view. So we've tried to address, if that were the case, what would you do about it? And we've made two suggestions. One is that um, you require ministers to uh, have a duty to make sure they've got the expertise to fulfil the functions of the bill. Now, that just places, you know, that might mean nothing at one level, uh, but on the other hand, it sends a pretty clear signal that Parliament and others have been concerned about this, and ministers are therefore put under a duty to make sure they've got that expertise. And that becomes a, a matter that Parliament can scrutinise ministers on over time. So that's one device. And the other device was to make sure, as John touched on earlier, that in um, making the administrative arrangements that government are proposing to make for a division within, uh, within the department, that they are required to set out a statement, either in the, in the forest strategy or otherwise, of how they intend to administer the arrangements, and thereafter, that if they were proposing any significant change, and that might raise further concerns about expertise, that they should be required to report that to Parliament and consult on it before they make that change. So it's not seeking to stop this, it's trying to make sure there are some disciplines around how this would operate to try and guard against the concerns that people clearly have got. So that's, that's where we're coming from on that. Um, Andrew, before I bring you in, there's a few committee members that would like to come in, and I'd li I do want to come back to John, because I know he's got something else on this. So it, maybe if I could bring Gail in and Claudia in, one after the other, and then you could, maybe all of you consider those, and then I'll come back to John. So, Gail. Thank you. Um, good morning, and thank you, Peter, for clarifying that. I'm not saying that any of the worries and concerns about loss of expertise are not valid, um, but the government have already given an assurance that the process will not result in a loss of expertise and that it's going to be a dedicated forestry division, so there's no talk about moving to other departments either. And when we were on Mull, um, Simon Hodge of Forestry Enterprise Scotland said to us that they already feel like a government department and he didn't see much changing. So I wonder if you've got any comment on that. Claudia, can I bring you in and then ask the panel to, to, to maybe answer both of you at the same right. time? Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Uh, from the perspective of um, my committee, uh, which has an oversight of um, biodiversity, I'd simply like to ask for a very quick response as to whether the, within the forestry functions um, there should be um, a reference to it on the, uh, the face of the bill, and if so, what? I'm going to bring Andrew in, uh, which uh, I guess will probably maybe tackle what Gail said and then somebody else in to, to tackle Claudia's question. Andrew. Yeah, just I suppose to draw a comparison with a part of government that we're perhaps more familiar with, and that is what was formerly the department and probably still is to most farmers, um, Rural Payments and Inspections Director, now, um, I, although I think it has a more official name there. And we... You know, we do see that as having a distinct identity. Um, we do see it as having a skill set and a, and a particular, um, maybe a slightly different mentality to other parts of government. 
but there is no doubt that over time it has been brought closer into the mainstream of government and I think the, the relationship with farmers has suffered because of that. So um, I don't have any particular comments about forestry, but I do think that uh, it's possible to have the structure that's being proposed, but there's certainly things you need to guard against. Okay. Does anyone want to, to come back on Claudia's point? Peter? Well, I'll come back on, on both uh, Claudia okay. Beamish's point and, and Gail Ross's point. That on Claudia Beamish's point, I was going to pick this up later under the questions about functions, because we, we would be suggesting that biodiversity as a part of a function be put on the face of the bill. But I'll come, maybe come to that later, can you know, with your yes, permission? Yes, please, later, yeah. On Gail Ross's point, um, I, I mean, I take the point she's making, and I, I mean, to me, this is a matter of reassurance rather than it's a matter of change per se. And that's why we suggested that the, dev the devices we have, it provide, they would provide some measure of reassurance that Parliament had got a bit of a handle on this over time. And it wasn't simply left to the administrative discretion of the particular minister or indeed the head of the department at that time to make changes. There was some kind of mechanism to allow parliament to scrutinise change given the concerns people have clearly got. They may not be fulfilled and therefore those provisions may not you know, have to be used but if they were there I think it would provide some kind of reassurance. Okay. I'm just going to bring John back in because I think the, the final uh, part of that was interesting. Thank you, Kavina. It's another uh, question about the organisational arrangements, and, and at the moment, we have the situation where research is GB and indeed should be international as well. Do you have any concerns about the research function? And if so, how could they be addressed in the new arrangements? Um, John, do you want to tackle research? Yes. Um, obviously, research isn't really in the bill, um, and I understand there's a lot of kind of discussions and negotiations going on behind the scenes that I'm not particularly privy to, so I don't know where the kind of desired landing point of that is. Our feeling has been that we would like to see forest research continue as, you know, as large a body as possible, a, a body with a UK-wide remit. I think that's particularly important given some of the sort of plant health issues that it deals with that clearly don't respect any borders. Um, and whether the, the future version of that is a, is a kind of forest research limited that's a, you know, perhaps a joint venture between the three governments or three departments or whether Scotland leads on certain sections and, and England and potentially Wales lead on others, then, then um, any of those, you know, we don't have a fixed view as to which of those is best. What we don't think would be a sensible way to do would be to have a complete divorce and try and end up with a forest research Scotland because we don't think there's enough of a critical mass to sustain two or three forest research bodies. I, I see you all nodding in agreement, so I, I'm, I'm assuming that, that that maybe wraps that question up. Can Thanks. I move on to the second theme which R Richard is going to, to lead on? Good morning, <coughs> morning uh, <coughs> panel. Um, we touched on it slightly a minute ago. Forest Forestry functions. Section 2 of the bill stated that the Scottish ministers must promote sustainable forest management and must prepare a forestry strategy. Several of the panel have already written in in regards to this theme. Um, can I ask you, should the bill specify matters that the Scottish ministers should have regard to when preparing, preparing the forestry strategy? If so, what would you propose to include? And do you think the bill should require a draft for a strategy to be scrutinised in Parliament before the final version is published. I also have another question after that. Okay, so I, I, I think that there's, there's two distinct and very important questions uh, that Richard's raised. Who'd like to uh, kick off? Um, Peter, I'm going to take you and then Anne and then John, if I may. Okay, um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the second question, uh, should there be greater scrutiny? Yes, I, I think is the answer to that. I mean, that draft should be consulted on uh, our preference would be that the, the, the statement should go to Parliament for approval and not just be tabled in Parliament. Uh, that might be uh, seen as overkill, particularly by the government, but that's nonetheless our view. That it, gives, it provides an opportunity for scrutiny at that point. So I think yes to your, to your second question. On in, in developing the sustainable forest management strategy, uh, our view would be that ministers should take, have regard to a range of other things that they're not currently required to have regard to. And in this respect, we're trying to, our suggestions are trying to bring greater alignment between this proposed bill, or this proposed, yes, this bill rather than proposed bill, uh, and existing statute that's to do with land uh, it, 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 that's already been passed. So, for example, in the Community Empowerment Act and the Land Reform Act, 
and in, in the Climate Change Act, there are particular uh, matters that are there. I, I know that ministers are required to have regard to the Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement and indeed the Climate Change Bill in drafting and in, in carrying out their functions in relation to this bill. But I think it would be helpful to have some of these things on the face of the bill. And I, I guess, can you know, that the, I'll just touch on some of the things that are there to give you a fuel for, for what's in other bills. So there's quite a, a focus in other land bills about economic and social uh, development and that the part that land can play, whether that's forestry or other land, can play in economic and social development. There are questions about the realisation and fulfilment of human rights and the observance of human rights to jobs, housing, and so on. There are basic human rights in relation to that. There's reference in other bills to regeneration, to social well-being, to public health, to inequalities, to ownership diversity, which is a point uh, was, was touched on earlier by John Finney. Um, there's reference to ministers having regard to the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights uh, in other bills, uh, and to internationally accepted principles and standards of, of land management, and to biodiversity, to come to Claudia Beamish's point. So for me, uh, and for Community Land Scotland, having a bit of a discipline on ministers when considering the strategy to have regard to these sorts of matters, I mean, I'm not suggesting that's the, the, the actual list, but those are the kind of things that I think could be strengthened in the bill. And then you'd have not just a technical bill, which is trying to transpose one piece of past legislation into the modern day uh, for, for the devolution purposes, but you've got something that's slightly broader in how we want forestry to be in the future and what the part forest land and other land that, the, that forest, uh, uh, Land Scotland could engage with. What, what the function of that is societally. It's not just about growing trees, it's a much broader range of things, and to try and capture that by creating a discipline in ministers to have regard to those things when drafting the strategy. So that, that's the way we would go about it. Peter, that was a, a, a very full answer. Um, Anne, I'm going to let you come in on that. I'll, I'll give a briefer answer. Thank um, you. On, on um, sustainable forest management, I think it's an entirely um, appropriate purpose um, in, in relation to forestry land. Um, we, however, would like to see a definition around sustainable forest management on the face of the bill. There's one given in the policy memorandum that seems... Um, entirely sensible and appropriate um, and we think that should um, appear on the face of the bill rather than sit behind it. Um, I, I think on uh, strategy entirely appropriate that we have a strategy um, and I, I would agree that it, it should be widely consulted on um, and we'd also like to see a fairly regular review period, um, poss possibly not more frequently than around 10 years, but it is something that we should um, keep under review and we'd like to see something in the bill about a review period as well. Sorry, can I just push you just, just so I understand on the review process. So you have forest plans that, that are, are, are long term and you have shorter reviews to take into account things that have happened. Um, with maybe sort of five-year intervals and then a major review at 10 years. Yeah. Are you suggesting it should just be 10 years or are you suggesting there should be a, a lesser review every five years and a major review every 10 years? I, I, think, I think when we're talking about an overarching government strategy, then, then 10 years is probably um, uh, frequently enough. Uh, or fre sorry, frequent enough. Um, uh, I think with... with uh, forest plans and, and regional approaches, that's, that's slightly different territory. Okay, John. Um, taking the strategy first, if I might. Uh, yes. I think we feel very strongly that this should be an open consultation. The, the, the bill is quite light on the details of what consultation there might be. Um, and that the, the strategy itself is subject to you know, parliamentary approval rather than simply being um, put before parliament. Uh, we think if we're going to have a consultation, then there probably needs to be a technical clause saying that there's one year to make it happen or so on after the um, bill's implemented. Otherwise, there will be a, otherwise, it will be a very much a rush job to get it in the, the, the day the bill passes. Um, and we certainly feel that there should be a fixed review period. We've gone for five years, but perhaps ten with a refresh at five would be, would be fine. Um, we've noted that 2019 is the centenary of the Forestry Act um, and I think it's quite a good opportunity, this would time quite well to use the strategy as an opportunity to kind of celebrate the past hundred years and 
set up Scottish forestry for the next hundred years. That's quite a long time scale even for forestry. But there's a, there's a good opportunity there to use it as a big um, exercise in promoting sustainable forest management. <coughs> On SFM, we think that's the right um, kind of hook and we agree that the, the, the definition that's in the policy memorandum is the one we should um, adhere to and it would be helpful if it was in the bill. It's I don't think sustainable forest management is going to be relevant to, to any other kind of bill that goes through Parliament. It's not one of those things like sustainable development itself that's, that's kind of used widely. It's, it's quite a, a technical term and it would be useful to have it set. This is how we understand what it means today. The, other, the one point we wanted to make is that sometimes sustainable forest management is taken as being the same as simply complying with the UK forest standard. And while we agree UK forest standards is the appropriate kind of minimum standard for all forest management, we want to hopefully, uh, uh, and the bill and the associating policy make it clear that in managing the national forest estate and in incentivising private landowners that Scottish ministers are looking to go above and beyond the minimums of UK forest standard. FE already does that. Um, through the work on the National Forest Estate for Recreation and Biodiversity, and the Forestry Commission Authority side does that by incentivising landowners through, through grants. And we want to see that carry on, not revert back to UK forest standard as the basic standard everywhere. OK, Andrew, do you want to come in on that? OK, Richard, you, you wanted to come back with another question. Uh, convener, actually, <laughs> Andy and John Hollingdale have uh, nearly answered my second question uh, good anticipation. Um, but basically, to the other members, um, should the sustainable forest management be defined in the face of the bill uh, or in an associated order? And do you think there should be explicit mention of afforestation and new planting in the bill? Who, who'd like to go? Anne, would you like to go on that? Um, follow up on that. I, I, I said that I would like to see a definition um, on the face of the bill. In terms of... Um, of deforestation, I, I don't actually think that is something for the bill. I think um, that's something for the strategy. I think that's a very current desire and a very a very laudable one. But I think if we want this bill becomes an act to, to stand the test of time, in 20, 30 years' time, um, we, we, might, we might be where we want to be in Scotland in terms of uh, afforestation. Um, and it, it might not be appropriate to, um, to want to continue to see more and more planting. So I think um, just uh, uh, for the longevity of the bill, it would make sense that that desire sits with a strategy and with policy rather than in legislation. OK, thanks. Um, Peter, do you want to come in? Yeah. On the definition, um, I, I think it, there should be some requirement in, on the face of the bill to have a definition, I'm not convinced the definition itself needs to be on the face of the bill because that would be something that no doubt over time would adapt and change and therefore leave scope for it to be amended more easily than having something on the face of a bill. But if there was a requirement that ministers publish a statement about what their definition is, that would be sufficient to give reassurance. And I think as John Hollandale says, this is a very particular thing for forestry. It's not a, it's not a broader purpose and therefore it would be appropriate. Uh, to, to make some requirement like that, I think. Uh, as to the afforestation targets and new planting, I, I would agree with uh, Anne Gray that that should be something that's within the strategy and not on the face of the bill. Okay, Richard, are you, are you... Okay. Um, I'd like to move on to the next theme, which will be led by the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Um, yeah, Peter, you started to touch on it earlier on before we had to stop you. I'm sorry about that. Um, are you clear about the difference between forestry land and other land? And if not, what can be done to make these definitions clearer? Peter, as you got um, cut off in, in mid-flow, I'll let you start on that, and then I'm sure everyone else will want to come in. I think I'm clear what it is, the difference, but I don't think the bill is at all clear on what the difference is. I think I found it very confusing. I, I don't, I mean, in principle, I think it's a, a, a section, or part 10, section 10, they do talk about forest land as both forest land and other land, but then they use the term forest land throughout all the rest of the, the bill in effect. And I just think that's confusing for people. Uh, if, if the Forest Land Scotland still have two distinct purposes, which I hope it does have, about forest land and other land for sustainable development, I think you've got to define it in that kind of way. And I think that John Hollingdale, his evidence I was reading 
has talked about forest land and non-forest land, and that, that might be sufficient. But to make a clear distinction throughout the terminology in the bill, I think it's really quite important. Otherwise, people will be pretty confused about this. If you'd like to uh, come back. John, I'd, I'd, I've read your evidence. If you'd like to, to, to clarify that, please. Yeah, so I think, it's, I think there's, a, there's a sensible and laudable um, intention there to, to recognise that Forestry and Land Scotland will manage areas of forestry and areas of, of kind of non-forest land. Um, and what's caused the confusion is the National Forest Estate, where we are at the moment, already includes a whole range of types of land. Some areas that are not covered in trees but are managed kind of in conjunction with um, forest land, forestry, forestry bits, woodland, whatever you want to call them, and then other bits that are managed for wind farms, agriculture and so on. And I think there's a sensible intention there. The, the way is probably to simply pull apart the holdings and classify this is forest land that's managed for sustainable forest management. If there are areas currently in the National Forest Estate that are used for agriculture, for instance, we just classify them as non-forest land. And then any new additions, any new land that Scottish ministers either acquire or transfer, because I assume it will be possible for them to transfer land from other Scottish government bodies, simply slots into one of, one of the two classifications. Uh, just so I understand that, I mean, the, there are some forests that, that are bought with, with open land above the tree line, yeah. which is integral to giving the, the forest the right environment for, for a mixture of species. Would you separate those two or would you keep them the same? Because one of the issues has been, as I've seen it, is Forestry Commission planting up some areas of these open land to make up shortfalls. Mm. And do you feel there's a danger there? Um, I think that's a, a kind of... That's a policy issue in terms of planting areas that they shouldn't plant or a, or a technical issue. I would, my feeling would be where you have open ground, whether it's above the tree line or, you know, unplantable bog in the middle of a forest or whatever, that if it's managed coherently as a forest unit, then you keep it as a, as a forest unit. Okay. And it, really it's about, you know, the management practice defines that. If, if there's areas being planted that shouldn't be planted, then that's a slightly different issue. Um, obviously, potentially, of course, as climate changes, natural regeneration might push the tree line higher. So, the, you know, the, the boundaries of our forests are not absolutely fixed. No. Ray, did you want to come in? And then I'd like to bring Anne in, if I may. Just a very short supplementary question to that. We've had some concerns that because the bill covers both kinds of land, forestry land and other land, that land currently in forestry may then become other land and what protections would be in the bill to protect forestry land especially if we're trying to increase the national forest and do you want to start on that and try and bring in some of the other points yeah no i, I mean i think you've reflected a, a concern of ours there that it's it, that it's not clear in the bill what takes precedence you know um will we'll, um you know, is is the will forestry land always be managed under the sustainable forest management purpose, and will other land always be managed under the sustainable development purpose, or or not? And there's there's I think there's a confusion there um, that that certainly needs sorted out in in the bill. Um. John, do you want you you you're looking as though you want to come back in on that? I was just going to say I think there's a you have to draw a distinction between a classification issue and an actual practical management issue, it seems to me, that there may be areas that are classified currently because they're on the National Forest Estate, but they have nothing to do with forestry. And reclassifying them as, as, as kind of non-forestry, if it's a starter farm, it's still on the National Forest Estate, or if it's being leased to you know, a Croft Common Grazings, for instance, it's still at the moment forestry land, well that doesn't reflect the reality of what's happening there. Now the, the issue that you're talking about is, is whether land actually practically gets managed differently, I think is a policy thing. The Scottish ministers have a presumption against removal of um, trees without compensatory planting unless there are overriding environmental reasons for doing so. So you'll be aware in, in Caithness and Sutherland, you know, areas of forest are being cleared to be restored for, for bog. That's a, that's a kind of 
tactical management issue to meet another Scottish Government policy. I don't think it's, a, it's the classification issue that we're talking about here. Okay, um, uh, Peter, I'm going to bring you back in because you started this off saying that you were confused. I hope you're now completely clear on, on the definition between two lands. Are you going to tell us that? Um, well, I'm, I'm becoming less and less clear as the conversation <laughs> goes on. But the, on Rhoda Grant's point, I'm not sure, I mean, I hadn't thought about that particular angle, and I'm not sure that the bill itself could safeguard that. I think it comes to what John Hondiel said. It's, it's a question of how the then owners and managers of that land, the Forestry Commission currently, or, or Forest Enterprise, or the new arrangements in future, how they classify things. And I guess as an operating principle that once you'd allocated land to the forest category as opposed to the other land category, you wouldn't... I can't, th I can't think why they would want to reallocate it to other land if it was diminishing the forest, the amount of forest we've got, because that would run completely contrary to all the targets that they've got and so on. So I can't think they would want to do that, but you could have a requirement to report on that if they, if they went, wanted to reclassify in that direction and therefore threatened in any way the forest targets, you could get a reporting requirement that, that brought that to light. But I, I, I don't think that's a matter for the bill, I don't think. No, I, I mean, I, I think the issue is, you know, do you take it out of forestry and put it into a wind farm or, or you know, I, I think it becomes very complicated. So yeah. I'm not sure I'm any clearer as a result of that conversation. So maybe, John, we could move on to your next theme. Get more clarity in the next bit. Um, yes, continuing with definitions and such like, uh, moving section 13 talks about the management of land to further sustainable development. Subsection 1, furthering the achievement of sustainable development. Now, this has already been mentioned. Uh, I think at least two of you, Mr. Bohr and Ms. Gray, in your submissions specifically kind of bring this up. So the question really is, um, is the term sustainable development familiar and workable, or do we need some kind of definition? Um, if I start with this, I... I um from our perspective, I think it's reasonable to have a, a purpose around land that isn't forestry land if the new land agency is to manage other land, and, and it will. Um, and sustainable development seems entirely um, appropriate. But it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very broad concept, um, and one that um, is, is, is very difficult to pin down to absolute definitions. Our concern with it um, comes in when it's, when it's used um, in conjunction with the compulsory purchase powers. That's our, our um, main concern, that um, because there's no criteria given around how that compulsory, we're extending compulsory purchase powers to include sustainable development through this bill, and there's no criteria given as to how a judgment will be made around um, the, the purchase of that. Of and that I, don't want to, I don't want to cut I, you am short. Am I moving on? The, the compulsory purchase falls very neatly into the next theme, yeah. um, I yeah. think, so which, which you'll, you'll get a chance to explain on. That's, I think if you, if, if you could leave that side of it and just see if you could d develop on the sustainable uh, development part. I, I, well, I think from, from our perspective, um, uh, the, our thought was that it, it, you know, it, it's incredibly difficult to define sustainable development, um, and but, but it does seem like a reasonable purpose under which um, the government would manage other land in its ownership. Yeah, I mean, if I can just turn it kind of the other way around from uh, the convener, I mean, if we leave aside the compulsory purchase, are there any other reasons why we would want a definition of sustainable development? I think, I think it would be incredibly difficult to, um, to create a definition in law. Oh, okay. You, you, you make that point yeah. in your submission, I yeah. think. Yes, that's yeah. right. uh, Andrew wanted to come in on that, and then Peter, I think. We would echo the, the comments that have been made. I think the, the difficulty in defining it for us speaks to the, the, the malleability of it. You know, it can be turned to all different sorts of purposes. Um, we are concerned, for example, about it being used um, to buy land <coughs> for renewable energy developments and seeing um, you know, that being a, a continuing trend. We are concerned that it could be used to um, uh, purchase farms. Again, we're sort of drifting into the compulsory purchase area. 
we made comment in our written submission about you know perhaps providing examples, maybe not nailing it down to a particular definition, but trying to give it a bit more form. Um, it is an area we think needs work. We're not against the concept of sustainable development, but without any kind of limits to it, um, there is a risk that it could become very contested and uh, quite divisive in the longer term. Well, maybe we did. You would want it to be something that could be changed over time. So, would it not be in the face of the bill if we were doing a definition? Should it be somewhere else? Uh, the, the mechanics of how it's done, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I have a strong opinion here and now on that. Uh, I, you know, we, we understand that you can't, um, with something like sustainable development, be absolutely precise. But it is just about giving it a bit more structure. Okay, and then uh, my next question would be that um, is, is this bill actually the right place, the right vehicle to take forward provisions on the management of non-forest land for sustainable development, as Section 13 says? I'm going to bring Peter in on that, if I may, uh, John. He, he looked so he wanted to come in on the last one. Right, yeah, sorry, I'm pretty I'm sure he'll have a view on this. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to, if I can, respond to the last one yes. too, because I think this is quite important. That the, I mean, sustainable development is an important principle. It's an important concept. Uh, it's well established, has been around for many uh, years now, and it's caused no real practical problem that I can detect. I think there's a lot of debate about it, but I can't detect any real practical problem that's come from the current position. And it's certainly added to thinking about a whole range of issues around the environment and climate and about land management and so on, and, and it's led to other action. And you'll not be surprised to know, you're not the first committee of parliament to wrestle with this question. I'm sure Mr. Stevenson in in wearing former hats will have wrestled with us very directly. I've encountered it in my past life as well. Um, and so it's been the subject of a lot of debate in Parliament and at no time has Parliament ever sought to try and define it on the face of a bill. And I think there's good reason for that. I think the other thing to be clear about is that this has been the subject of court challenge. Minister, Scottish ministers have been challenged on the definition uh, of sustainable development in the case of the Park Crofters. Uh, that, that uh, took place a number of years ago. And Lord Gill, I will uh, read you what Lord Gill said uh, when, when judging on that. In my view, the expression sustainable development is in common parlance in matters relating to the use and development of land. It is an expression that will be readily understood by legislators, the ministers and the land court. And I'm here to take Lord Gill's judgment on this, I have to say. Um. And on the second question, if I may? Yep, that's what I was going to ask. I, I do think this is the right place to have something about other land um, because we, you, you know, here's an opportunity that Parliament's got. This is picking up, uh, as I recall, a manifesto commitment from the government, so it was, uh, you know, which was elected on that manifesto to have a land agency. That in turn picked up uh, um, arguments that were around at the time of the Land Reform Act and the creation of the Land Commission. Uh, and so there's a, there was a kind of outstanding issue that had to be resolved, that there would be a place for government to have other land and that the Forestry Commission given, uh, and the Forest Enterprise, given their expertise in land management, which is extensive, albeit in a forestry context, that nonetheless that would seem an appropriate place to put the wider um, holding of land by government for a range of sustainable development purposes in the same place and try and apply some of that expertise about land uh, in that context. I don't think you would have a, a standalone bill that would deal with this, and it's not uncommon for you know, bills to pick up other things on the way. I think this is a reasonable fit. Uh, I, th I welcome the fact that this is in the bill. I think there's an opportunity here for um, government and parliament uh, and the people of Scotland over time um, to be able to manage other land in appropriate ways in the public interest. So, that, so I think it is appropriate to have it here. Okay, and do you want to come in on that? Yeah, uh, we, we do have um, some concern about this issue of, of other land. I mean, we recognise that the National Forest Estate, the minute, is, is broader than just forestry land, and that needs to be recognised. Um, um, it's, it's not to say we're entirely against the idea of um, other land being acquired by this agency and managed in uh, for sustainable development purposes through that agency. But um, we, we do also have a concern that of how far that, that might extend. So are we likely to see things like natural nature reserves, elements of the Crown Estate being managed under that, that agency? And if, if so, is that, is, that, is that the best way to 
to do it, I suppose. Is that, is that structure right? And our concern is that um, we could get to a situation where an agency has multiple uh, objectives and how does it then sort out those multiple objectives? If, if objectives, say, if the specialism within com competing, I don't want to use the word competing, but alternative agencies, there's a way of discussing um, how they might uh, find a, a, an appropriate balance between different ob objectives. Um, whereas if it all sits with one agency, there's a concern that one thing will override other interests or that the agency just gets stuck and can't make a decision and, and move I forward. I think we need to worry about now or is that something, a kind of bridge we could cross when we came to it if that did become a problem? It, it's... Um, By creating a, a prov I suppose by, by creating a provision in this bill, we could get to, to it, it, it allows that expansion, that worrying expansion to happen, um, but I'm not quite sure how this bill would appropriately restrict that expansion. So it possibly is something that we, um, we note and uh, worry about when it, when it happens. Um, I'm just going to let John have one more question to, 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 to sum up this theme, and then I'm afraid we're going to have to move on to the next one, which is inextricably linked. John. Well, maybe, maybe this can be brief answers, hopefully. Uh, is it clear to you when sustainable forest management applies and when sustainable development applies? Who'd uh, John, are you, uh, and I'd ask you to answer that specific question. If I, if um, I don't think I'm absolutely clear, but I think if you gave me a list, we could sort them. <laughs> Um, I think the distinction and putting both in the bill reflects the reality of where Forest Enterprise and Forestry Commission are now, that over the last 25 or 30 years, the range of activities that they carry out and the range of government agendas that they seek to deliver has vastly broadened from a very timber-focused thing to now as forest education starter farms, all of which is, you know, delivering the Scottish government agenda. I think having sustainable forest management and sustainable development as two platforms, two, two bases to work on, allows a much more sensible way forward than simply trying to make everything fit under sustainable forest management and, and making that um, you know, almost a kind of anything we want it to mean. And so I think it is more sensible, and if you, if you had a list of possible initiatives, we could all sit down and we pretty much all fit them one to the other. I don't think there will be a lot of difference between. Right. Andrew. Um. If I can, just one observation here, but I think the importance of remembering the, the individual, personal, small-scale circumstances compared to the national agenda, national objectives. So for agriculture, in some parts of the country, um, you know, I don't think anyone would probably describe it as sustainably done, but forestry has developed in particular areas and it's, it's delivered national objectives, but it's, delivered, it's expanded to a point where it has compromised the critical mass of agricultural activity and agricultural systems in that area. Um, we are, we're probably meeting our objectives in forestry there and doing sustainable forest management, but has that been sustainable for the, the individuals in that industry, in, in agriculture in that area? So I think it's about... You know, as we say, we're not against the idea of sustainable development here, but it's just to remember that it, it's going to operate at all different scales, be it an individual farm, a forest region, forest district, or nationally. Okay, I'm going to leave that there and move on, if I may. Uh, the next uh, theme is going to be led by Mike. Thanks, Convener. We now turn to the acquisition, compulsory purchase and disposal of land sections of the bill, which are perhaps the most controversial area because we have this agreement in the evidence presented to us. Um, as Peter in particular might know in his past experience, I've, um, I'm always loath to give ministers um, powers that they neither um, need nor have ever, in this particular case, have ever used. Uh, so it's rather, it is an interesting concept that we're transposing compulsory purchase powers in particular into this new bill when they've never been used. Uh, and giving that power to ministers. So I'd like to ask the panel for their views, particularly on the, the power to give ministers the power to, to compulsory purchase. And what I'm going to do is, because 
um, in your evidence, you all have uh, strong views on this. So I'm going to start on my right of the panel with Andrew and um, um, work to my left. So, Andrew, first, please. I think recognising what you've said there about the fact that it hasn't been used in, in sort of comparable circumstances, we are seeing examples, though, across the country of where the compulsory purchase system isn't working for individuals, it's broken. And a number of organisations um, who are far more expert in this area than us have commented on the fact that it is in need of major overhaul. So given that we do have a system that we believe um, needs serious looking at, it, it seems an odd time, uh, an odd decision to extend it in this bill um, to further sustainable development. We just, you know, we, we think if it's never been needed, and it's not working for in, in other realms, then, then it really is an inappropriate time and an inappropriate route to go down. It's not perhaps going to be um, used um, on a regular basis, may never be used, but I think the fact that it would sit there and that that power would be there would always affect discussions. That's how we see it often happening is, you know, um, well, you know, you, here's the offer, take it. If you don't, we've got compulsory purchase power, so we'll have it anyway. You know, that really is where the, the discussion in, in a number of cases in the past has gone. And if we are growing our forest uh, asset as we are, um, without this, um, we're not quite sure why it's necessary now to have it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring Peter in then, and then I want to bring in Stuart, because he's got a follow-up to that. So, Peter... Uh, uh, probably a, a different view? A very different view. I'm not only entirely relaxed about it being in the bill, I would welcome it being in the bill. In fact, I think it would be a huge omission if it wasn't in the bill. The controversy here would arise by not giving ministers this power, not by giving them this power, in my view. And why do I say that? And just because something has not been used in the past, partly because of the sheer complexity, which is something that Andrew's alluded to, of using it. I mean, when I was a council leader, I can remember many times trying to, you know, to persuade the lawyers you know, couldn't we use our powers to help resolve this situation? I can think of ransom strips and things that were held that caused, you know, real difficulties to communities uh, in, in that territory at that time and, and to economic developments of various kinds. And I was always told it's just impossible to use these powers. And that's, it wasn't that there was no need or no desire. It was very, very difficult to you. Now, that's a, that's a right and proper thing because compulsory purchase means you're taking something from somebody else that is currently theirs and they've got property rights in that. So there needs to be hurdles. I tend to agree with Andrew. If, if, if the current arrangements are not uh, working, review the arrangements. That's not a reason for not putting these powers into the bill. They would subsequently be reviewed in any review of compulsory purchase. And I think that it would seem very odd to me that uh, you know, ministers would not have the right or the ability to do compulsory purchase when they thought that was uh, essential in any given circumstance. And you can't anticipate the circumstances of the future. So I think it is, it is uh, absolutely right that it's there. Uh, and it's absolutely right that ministers have the opportunity to do that. And they can't go around willy-nilly just buying up land. I mean, there, there are umpteen hurdles to get over. The thing has to be in the public interest. Uh, you've got to demonstrate that very clearly before you could take action. There are a whole range of challenges that can be made to the process uh, as you go through the process. Uh, you've got to prove it's the only way you could get the land. There are no alternative ways that you could meet the need by other land. So this is not straightforward for ministers. Nonetheless, it's an important power to have. Um, sorry, hold on, Mike, if I, if I may. Can I just uh, bring Stuart in and can I just remind panel members that each one of you will want to have, have your view on, on, on an emotive subject like this. That, and, and I'm hamstrung by time as well, so keeping the answers short. And if I could bring Stuart in, Mike, and then I'm going to bring John in. Uh, thank you, Convener. My question is tiny and simply for Andrew, uh, who used the word extension, extended to describe what's in the bill in relation to compulsory purchase. My understanding has been this is merely a restatement of the status quo ante. Uh, could you perhaps justify your use of the word extended or reconsider it? Our understanding is that there are the compulsory purchase powers there already for sustainable or for mm -hmm. forest management, but that for delivery of sustainable development, this would be something new. Um, okay. Uh, Mike, you wanted to say something? I wanted to follow up that because specifically, um, my question is, when do you think the compulsory purchase powers, if they're in this bill and it passes, would be appropriately used? I, because nobody has been able to tell us, uh, give us specific examples 
when these powers would be used. The fact that they've never been used is another issue, but when would they be used? I mean, Peter's mentioned ransom strips, but is that, is that actually the case? Are there, are there issues where you think that these powers could be used? John, do you want to try on that? And, and, and we'll maybe come back if we've got time to, to ask Peter for a specific example where it might be used. John? I, yeah, briefly on <coughs> compulsory purchase powers, I tend to agree with Peter, but also with Andrew that the, the process does need review. I think we'd be, but that's not a reason not to have the powers in the bill. In terms of a specific example, I mean, the one that strikes me as potentially where forest enterprise have a forest that's actually landlocked and inaccessible and they cannot remove the timber um, because and the, and the owner of the surrounding land refuses to sell you know a section of land that would be sufficient to put a road in to extract the timber for instance now whether whether there are live case I'm aware of cases where that has been the case in the past and a solution has eventually been found one or two cases where the community has bought the forest and, and managed to find a solution where FE couldn't. So that, that might not even pass the compulsory purchase test. But um, it would be more help it would certainly would have been helpful had there been plenty of examples to illustrate where the powers were going to be used. So can I say one thing about disposals? Are we covering that? At um, this well point I'd like here, to just stay on compulsory purchases if I may and, and, okay. and if I can John just make an observation, you know land when it's purchased if it has access restrictions it's probably reflected in the purchase price mm. um, so you know maybe that's part of the process as well mm. and, and if it is to open up land then perhaps there is uh, compensation due to to the compulsory powers being used and would you like to just comment on that uh, yes we don't feel that the case has been made at all for having this um, these compulsory purchase powers um, in the bill um, the only explanation I've, I've had for why they're there um, is that we didn't want to lose, the, there was a compulsory purchase power around forestry in uh, previous legislation, we wanted to carry over, we didn't want to lose it, but it's never been used and, and actually I think there was a public inquiry in England um, years ago that suggested it wasn't really a very good idea to use it um, and, and it's, not been, it's, it's not been used since. Um, and, and then the only explanation for extending that to sustainable development purposes is one of equity. We just want equity in the bill, so, so we want it to apply to both purposes. Um, now, it's a very um, broad power. Um, there's, uh, we, we don't think it should be there, and I want to be absolutely clear about that. If it is going to be there, there absolutely needs to be clearer um, criteria around how it will be used for sustainable development purposes. Um, th there is no definition of right. the land that it might apply to, if there's any exemptions or exclusions from land that it might be applied to, and uh, there's no criteria under which an assessment or a judgment would be made about whether it would be appropriate to um, compromise the the, um, the the ability uh, or, or compromise the private use of land and, and take it into the public sector. Mike, I'm, I think we've had a sort of balance for you, if I may, and I, I'd like to move on and, and move to the next theme, which is Rhoda. And if I could just remind everyone to keep your answers short, though we, we have quite a few more themes to get through, and I would like to hear your views <coughs> on all of them, as I'm sure with the committee. Rhoda. Okay. Um, section 19 of the bill refers to a definition of a community body. Um, there are other, there is other legislation that d defines community bodies. Does this definition work along with those other definitions? This, should it be amended to fit better with, say, the Community Impairment Act? Who'd like to go on that? Uh, John, sorry. Um, there are two things. Firstly, the Community Impairment Act has four separate definitions of community bodies. Um, and that's one of the problems is that it wouldn't be possible to, to kind of come up with a definition that matches all of those. Um, our view of sections 18, 19 and 20 is that they actually aren't necessary to be on the bill at all and should be removed as we understand it. Um, these, these powers, the Forestry Commission currently has powers to delegate its functions for forestry management to community groups. Scottish ministers 
don't need those powers transferred to them because they already have those, those powers. Forestry Commission forestry commissions needed them as a, as a kind of special exemption um, to allow leasing. Uh, prior to 2010, that wasn't possible at all. So it was possible for Forestry Commission to lease land for agriculture, for instance, but leasing woodland for woodland management just wasn't allowed under the 67 Act. And so it had to be amended to, to add these powers. Um, they're in the bill because of this kind of general process of if it's in the Forestry Act, we'll, we'll transfer it. But actually, we don't believe that these powers are necessary. Scottish ministers already have the powers to, to lease, sell, and buy. Section 17 of the Act, of, of this Forestry and Land Management Act, will give Scottish ministers the powers to dispose of land. Um, the Community Empowerment Act sets out the mechanisms by which community bodies, as defined in that Act, can um, apply to acquire land from Scottish ministers and other public bodies. And this, this section 18, 19 and 20 doesn't really add anything at all. So I think we can talk about whether the definition should be changed, but actually I think it's not necessary for it to be there at all. It's, an, it's, a, it's a very positive intention that we welcome from the Scottish Government to sort of demonstrate their commitment to the community empowerment in gender, but we actually don't think it's necessary here. Peter, I'm going to give you the opportunity, not with just a yes and no answer, but a short one, if I may. I would just say, I, I think John's got a very good reasoned point made there. And the only point I would make to the committee is just to, um, that that should be tested with the, the, the bill team and the minister, if I could suggest, so that if there is something that we are missing that gives an additional power, then that would be worth having. I can't see it at the minute, but, but if not, then I think what John said is it would commend itself. believe there are powers to delegate the functions. I mean, I know the Scottish Government can lease sell, whatever, but the bill in, in section 18.1 um, talks about del delegating their functions under section 9 and 13 to a community body. Would that, I'm sorry, that's maybe a wee bit technical, kind of off, off the cuff. But. Our understanding is that that's, that arose because of this original restriction on the forestry commissioners who weren't allowed to delegate forest management functions. So that's where the language came from um, when the amendment was made in the Public Services Reform Act of 2010. <coughs> that was the language that was used. But it doesn't, I think if you look at the explanatory notes of the bill, I think it's section 38, it makes it very clear that this only applies to land that's being let to communities. Okay. So if you were looking at matching the Community Empowerment Act, the definition that you need is the one that applies to communities that are letting, which is the one in part three of the Community Empowerment Act. Um, the, once, you, once you lease the land, then, then you can, as part of your, le your lease contract, you can set out you know, what the... Um, what the requirements of the lease are in terms of managing it in certain way to UK forest standard, et cetera, et cetera. But section <coughs> 17 of this act gives ministers the power to dispose of land by sale, lease, gift, and I think, um, to anybody, so it would, without any caveat at all. So it would seem rather strange that you then needed to set up a, if you, if you can lease the land to any private individual or any other organisation, why do you need to define special rules about these functions for um, community bodies? I mean, ev ev just stepping back, our view on disposal is actually that when, you, when ministers dispose of land, it should be with a commitment for whoever's taking it on, whether it's buying or leasing it, to continue to manage it to UK forest standard. We think it's important that land doesn't go out of forestry, but can I, can I just push you a wee bit yeah. on that, is, is, is that obviously most land, forestry land that would be sold would be subject to planting agreements and therefore standards would be, would be there implied anyway. Currently in the Parliament, the Parliament's agreed that uh, Scottish ministers may dispose of land from the forest estate, providing they replace that land and, and, and grow trees on the land that, mm. that they, they think. The, this bill is taking away that. So effectively the forest estate could be reduced and just in line with what you're saying are you comfortable with that a yes or no answer would be fine um 
we would like to see that policy of you know recirculating the the monies from disposal continue so I, I kind of answer i mean yeah i think repositioning the estate is is not necessarily a bad idea we wouldn't want to see the wholesale sell-off without kind of the the, the proceeds being reinvested um Roger, unless you've got a follow-up to that uh, i'd like to move on to the next theme which fulton will be leading yeah, thanks, Kavina. I'm going to um, ask about failing. Do you think that the provisions in the Bill on failing are an improvement on the provisions of the Forestry Act 1967? And just in the interest of time, I'll just ask the second question as well. Uh, do you think there's anything missing from the Bill uh, or that anything that should be removed? Thanks. Who'd like to go on that? A fairly specific question. Anne, would you like to start on that? Um, yeah, we, we, we do have concerns that, uh, against this issue of too much being left to secondary legislation. So um, I think there's, there's exemptions that existed um, in the original legislation or previous legislation that we would like to see on the face of, of this bill for, for clarity. Um, and there's, there's a slightly odd um, definition around felling as well that I, I think needs to be... Um, needs to be reviewed is not is not wholly accurate but our our, our main concern is, i think our main point is that the felling regulations from the 67 act have served us very well up to now and um we we've not taken those over wholesale a lot of the detail that was in there um is proposed to be dealt with under secondary legislation and there is a, there's a concern, again, it comes back to this long-term nature of, of forestry, that particularly for investors investing in commercial forestry, they would like as much certainty as it's not a very certain business to get into if you're waiting for your crop um, for, for 40 years, but they would like as much certainty around regulation as it is possible. So our preference would be to see more on the face of this bill. So, so you would want, you know, in terms of the second question, that you'd want more um, put into the bill around this rather than anything that's there removed as such? Yeah, yeah. Okay. John, do you want to add to, to that at all? Or? Um, so two things. We weren't particularly sure that it all needs to be added into the bill. We're also slightly unsure about the kind of entering all... Um, Felling notices and registration, the, the putting notices to the, the keeper of the land registry and so on, and whether that was an, an absolutely necessary step and whether that's going to add quite a lot of bureaucracy in practice. So we haven't quite seen that that's a necessary step to happen. Okay. Uh, no, neither Peter nor Andrew are catching my eyes. So, Fulton, if you're happy, I may move on to the, the next uh, theme, which is Peter. Yes, thanks, uh, convener. I mean, it, 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 we've, we've kind of touched on it as, uh, already with the last question, but my theme is on regulations on felling. And we know that this part of the bill does lack detail, since much of the detail will be provided in regulation, and we've, we've heard that already. But uh, are, the, are the panel content that much of the detail on felling will be in regulation? And, you know, an example here is exemptions to the need for a license to fell trees are included on the face of the Forestry Act 1967, but will, but will be in regulation under this bill. And to follow up to that, do you have any other concerns about other regulations related to this bill? And do you want to, you cover that in a bit of detail? I think just to reiterate what, what I said before, we would, we would prefer to see more <coughs> on the face of the bill and yeah. less left to secondary legislation. I'll also echo, we, we do have concerns about um, the, uh, the, the the requirement to um, to register to, to register felling notices with registers of Scotland not not in principle but just in terms of whether it's proportionate whether it's really necessary and whether it creates an awful lot of extra work and costs that's just largely unnecessary. Yeah. And and that point actually I think Stuart wanted to pick up on and and, and actually widen that. So can I bring Stuart yeah. in at this stage, please? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, convener. And let me first direct my question to Anne, because in the, uh, uh, the evidence provided by SLE, you, you talk on this subject. Um, since your position is that uh, Register of Scotland registration should not be required, how do you envisage that the purchaser of forest land that has obligations, which would, under this bill, be registered with 
Scotland, how would they know? How would the lawyers who are advising somebody in purchasing lands be aware of the obligations, which are a cost to the purchaser, if they're not at Registers of Scotland? I, I, I mean, that, that's, that's a fair point. Um, uh, Forestry Commission Register is, is, is not part of a solicitor's search, but I, I don't think there's been a problem up to now. I think people that are getting into buying, certainly commercial forestry, um, are well aware of, of what they're getting into and, and the obligations around that. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a big investment and not oh, something they're doing... Uh, yes, do forgive me, I understand that. I think we all understand that. But I just go back to my fundamental question. How would they know of these obligations? Uh, uh, through, through their advisors. Uh, how would their advisors know? Um, because they are part of the... The, the industry and they understand so, the so, obligations and, and the way that it works. So are you trying to tell the committee, and this may be perfectly proper that you do so, um, that every advisor knows of every well, such I, I, order I, throughout the whole uh, purview of uh, I, the Forest I, Estate in I, Scotland? I do understand the, the point that you're making, and yes, in theory, um, if you want to be sure, things need to come back through solicitor's search. My, my point is really about proportionality and whether is there a problem here that we're trying to address through this measure or if there's not a problem, do, do the, does the extra cost and burden merit the effort? Uh, what uh, understanding do you have of the cost? Uh, the, well, as I understand it, um, Forestry Commissioner, the Forestry Authority, the regulator, um, would be required to decide um, how much information it passes over to Registers mm. of Scotland and, and Registers of Scotland would be required to add something new to, to, to the register. So there's a cost there um, in terms of the public purse. Um, well, e equally, uh, John made reference to this uh, same, same, same topic. Are you aligned with SLE on this, or are you...? That, that would be a curious alignment, but actually there's a, a lot of similarity, I think, in our view. My understanding at the financial memorandum, I think, says 1,000 potential notices at £60 a year. I have no information on whether that's accurate. I can't, I'm reading entirely from a memorandum, but that 1,000 seems like a lot and a lot of staff time. Um, in terms of how would anybody know, at current, at present on the Forestry Commission website, there's a very good um, web-based utility, it's open to the public. You can um, find any piece of land in Scotland that you're interested in, go and find out whether there have been any forestry grant scheme, Scottish forestry grant scheme projects. Whether or not it has felling licences on it, I'm not absolutely sure, but it wouldn't be a difficult thing to, to, to add that, I think. And that would be a much more straightforward and, and kind of open and transparent place of having a kind of open web-based system run by the Forestry Commission or the Scottish Government Forestry Division as it will be in the future. Um, I would have thought that would, that would be a sufficient way of so, so available you, for someone doing due diligence on a purchase. So, so therefore you would place a duty on um, the Forestry Commission and its successors uh, to, as the bill does, provide the land register number that, that, that describes the land or alternatively identifies the deed in the register of sessions uh, that is there. Because I think in particular land selling can break up a previous registration, for example, mm -hmm. uh, on, in the register of sessions that might uh, split, split a property. Um, so, so really you end up with the same administrative burden but you're merely saying the Forestry Commission should carry it at no cost to the person owning the forest. Is that what you're suggesting? Um, no, I'm afraid I don't know the, the technicalities. <laughs> I'm not going to debate them. I was suggesting that by making it on a sort of publicly available web database with a you know, felling licence reference number, anybody who was interested would be able to find that there was a felling licence or some other notice to comply affecting the land that they are interested in would be go, able to go to the Forestry Commission or successors and ask for more so, details. So, finally, so in those cases when shortly, it's needed. Uh, finally, therefore, you're simply saying there should be a register, but it should be published by the Forestry Commission, not the registers. I think Scotland. using their existing web-based system seems like a simpler way than using the registers of Scotland, who are going to be very, very busy <laughs> with a huge amount of land registration. But it should be moment. done. 
Yeah, I think, I think the information can be made available in a much simpler right. way. Yeah. Thanks for giving me Claudia, that. you wanted to come in very briefly, and then I, I need to, to go to the last theme, which is Jamie. Yeah. Again, it's actually a broad question about land reform, so perhaps I should ask it at the end. I just okay, well, I, I'll move on to the next theme then. And, and I'm going to ask each of you uh, to answer this question as succinctly as possible. So, Jamie, if you'd like to lead on. Thank you, Convener. I'm going to move on to the um, financial mem memorandum of the bill. Um, uh, first of all, um, are you content with the financial memorandum in its current form? And does anyone have any view on the costs of this restructuring, rebranding, reorganisation, where that money should come from, uh, existing funds uh, within the Forestry Commission, or should it be externally provided by additional funding from the Scottish Government? I'd be keen to hear your views on that. I'm going to go straight to John, because I think I suspect you may have a view on that, and it might allow others to formulate theirs if they haven't got them already. John? Yeah, I'll take it in two particular things that we focused on. The, the IT bill, I noticed the financial memorandum has a very high, very large variance, which obviously is a matter of concern, and um, the whole, in some ways the whole idea about integration of computer systems is something that fills the forestry sector a bit with alarm because their experience of that has been SRDP process and I, you know, the committee is well aware of the issues with not only the cost of systems but actually making them work in the first place. So there's, a, you know, I, I don't need to say any more on that, I don't think. The, the other section is the branding and there's a cost there for four, of four million as an estimate. I, I don't have the means to argue with that, um, but I would worry about the rate of implementation um, and, and whether or not that four million includes the physical costs of staff to actually change the infrastructure, because this isn't simply kind of changing the letterheads and the sign outside the building and the website. There's a huge amount of physical infrastructure in, in Scotland's forests that will have to be changed. Someone will have to do that job. If it's being done in a year or two years, does that mean FE staff do that and nothing else? Um, or, or are there, in effect, additional contractors will come in to do that work and will that bring additional expense? Um, and we're concerned that the, the policy seems to be, well, it will be found within other Forestry Commission budgets. and. Air experience or air fear is that that means it will be taken away from social and environmental <laughs> projects, all the, all the kind of good positive things that Forest Enterprise does at the moment will be used in a rebranding exercise. John, so we said we think the money should come, you know, if there is extra money required, it should come as a one off. John, that's yeah, quite a know. full answer. Oh, if, can I sort of ask everyone to be as, as brief as possible and only add to that or disagree with it? Um, if that's possible, whatever your views. Andrew, do you have a view on it? No additions to that. Peter, do you want to say anything? Well, I have to say, I've never found financial memoranda as an entirely reliable guide to reality. It's so I, I think this is within the ranges that you'd normally expect, and it's, it's, I've got no particular comment to make on that at all. As to whether there should be additional uh, resources uh, added in, it would always be nice to get that so there was no cost to the programmes that uh, John Hollandale's mentioned. On the other hand, you know, this is a once in a how many decades expenditure, it's spread, probably spread over a period of years, so I don't think it's the biggest issue. Okay, and um, any, any comments on, on, on a very cheap computer system by current standards? <laughs> yeah. um, I, 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 what I picked up was the, was the, was the branding, the rebranding, and actually, you know, back to the original point of, is this really necessary at all? If we just have Forestry Commission Scotland and don't go down the route of... Um, taking this in, in, into division and agency of government, then we don't need to incur these costs. Um, so there's, there's a much more straightforward and potentially sensible route that would save us all quite a lot of money. Okay. Claudia, I can let you in very, very briefly if it's a brief question. It is very brief, and I appreciate a brief answer. Thank you, convener. I'd like to ask if this bill, um, in the view of the panel, facilitates opportunities for wider community... Uh, ownership of forestry and woodland in tandem with other relevant bills? And if not, what you would like to see in three sentences at the most, please. So a yes, no answer and, and, and maybe a two sentence uh, right. addition. Um, a, sorry, Claudia, I'm cutting you down. <laughs> Do, does that, who would like to lead on that? And would you like to start? 
Um, I, I think it does offer opportunities um, for communities to become more involved in forestry ownership and um, management. I think our only comment is that we would like to see better alignment, uh, so John's point about better alignment in terms of definitions for um, community bodies within Community Empower Act, but I, I, we, we feel it does that, yeah. John. Uh, I'd say I don't think the bill does, I mean, this is, and that's made comments already on sections 18, 19, 20, but I don't think that's the bill's job. But I do think the strategy will have an important role to play in stressing the kind of future management arrangements um, to ensure, in, ensuring that Forestry and Land Scotland carries on the very good work it's done historically through the National Forest Land Scheme and now through the Community Asset Transfer Scheme. So the, it's been a policy matter for Forestry Commission to advance land reform and I hope the strategy makes sure that it carries on doing so in the future. Sorry. Well done, John. You stretched that out a bit. Peter? I, I, I agree with that last point. Uh, I think that sums that up rather well. In our evidence, we've suggested that we would like to see communities being given a right to ask the new arrangements that the Forest, Forest and Land Scotland to own land on their behalf, potentially, as a means, as a, as a sort of interim step to them potentially buying land or to manage the land in conjunction with Forest uh, and Land Scotland. So I think that there's something that additionally could be put in to give communities, in the spirit of other pieces of legislation, rights to interact with the new body in that, in that direction. Um, that was a very long three sentences, uh, Peter. Andrew, your, your, your chance. Whether it does or doesn't, change the facts, I think it does send a very clear message that that's the direction of travel and communities are being encouraged into this. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, giving evidence to the committee this morning. I'm now going to suspend the, the meeting for five minutes for until we get the next panel sorted. Thank you. The meeting is suspended.
Uh, we now move on, well, remain on agenda item two, which is to hear, sorry, agenda item one, to hear evidence on the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill. And I'd like to welcome the new panel. Uh, first of all, Willie McGee, the coordinator of the Forestry Policy Group. Charles Dundas, who's the Scottish Public Affairs Manager for the Woodlands Trust. Malcolm Crosby, the Chair of the Forestry Commission Trade Unions. Dr. Maggie Keegan, Head of Policy and Planning the Scottish Wildlife Trust and Scottish Environmental Link. And Professor David Miller, Knowledge Exchange Coordinator of the James Hutton Institute. Um, thank you very much for, for being here this morning. We have divided uh, the session into themes, and I will try, where possible, to give everyone the chance to answer the questions. I would ask you to look at me if you want to uh, be brought into the theme. I, I would suggest if you look away from me, you, you, you won't get in. Please, when you're speaking, also do look at me, because there may be times when I might encourage you to be briefer with your answer. Uh, I hope that will never arrive. Uh, that situation will not arrive. The first uh, theme will be introduced by John Finney. John. Thank you, convener. Uh, morning, panel, and I'm sure you'll recognise much of this. I, I'm going to ask the same question as I opened the last session with, and that was, do you have any comments on the structure of the bill, how easy it is to understand and could any improvements be made? And perhaps, uh, Mr. McGee, uh, I read with interest your response, which says we approve of the bill as far as it goes. We want to see the long title embrace it, this potential. Could you maybe expand on that, please? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, we b um, believe that f forestry um, serves a wide range of functions, especially in, in respect of rural development and um, for communities. And that's one of the, the main reasons we, we, we looked at the long title. We said that that actually encompasses what we're looking for from the bill. Um, the structure and clarity, was it that you were, you were asking? The, the understandability of it. I mean, the, the, the structure, we're, we're relatively relaxed about in terms of how the bill was set out. Um, we believe that it could be um, much more innovative in its thinking to encompass much of what forestry we think can achieve for other Scottish government um, policy objectives, such as land reform um, and rural development, um, small business development. So we, we, um, we would like to see, as the bill progresses, um, uh, much more focus on, on these. I think in the first session there was much debate about sustainability, and we think the, uh, uh, the, the answer in many cases is, um, is this focus on um, enterprise and small-scale um, community uh, enterprise. If I may just push that just one further, and, and about the, the breadth of ownership, is that, is that an issue? That the, I mean, the breadth of ownership is um, uh, something that is quite, I mean, it's very difficult in Scotland to, to make definitive statements about something like forestry ownership. Um, we recognise that this is an opportunity to diversify ownership, um, but one of the things that we would like to see in the bill is some means by which you would be able to measure the, the scope and extent of different types of ownership in forestry in Scotland. Malcolm, do you want to come in on that? Yes, I, I've been involved through the National Forest Land Scheme um, and now CATS, um, the replacement with that, with um, working with communities on a number of things. Um, generally, the will is there within the Forestry Commission to do these things. The practical application of that is often the difficulty. For example, with renewables, communities are desperate to want to do this, but the, the finances just don't stack up. So, you know, the, the, the facilities are there for us to do it. The willingness is there for us to do it. Maggie, you indicate you want to come in. Um, yes, I just wanted to set out um, Link's response and Scottish Wildlife Trust's response um, to the whole bill. Our approach has been to look at it through the lens of the natural environment and native woodlands and what opportunities arise from that and, and actually about optimising the asset of forests because we've probably come a long way since the, the first act. Um, in terms of it's not just about timber production and the economy, but um, forests deliver so much more in terms of ecosystem services. And it's about whether this bill um, helps to realise the assets that occur in Scotland. David, did you want to come in on that? Yes, thanks very much. And um, maybe just observe that the, uh, the title um, raises some interesting expectations, I would say, with the description reference to land management and 
dare say we're going to come to, but what, what we expect of Scotland's land and the role Scotland's land plays for its communities and more widely. Um, what it does do, I think, is give an opportunity to see where land can be part of that pathway to the sustainable development goals and mm -hmm. some big picture stories as well, actually, given that woodland and trees, forests, occupy such a high proportion of Scotland's land and the type of land that represents, carbon-rich soils, land and key water catchments and so on. Charles, you, you haven't said anything. I, I, I feel sure you have a view. Um, yeah, I, I think in terms of the structure, it's, it's workmanlike. It sets out to do what it needs to do in terms of transposing the 1967 Forestry Act into Scottish legislation. But I don't think we should kid ourselves that this does much more than that. There are a few sweeties thrown in uh, in terms of uh, a statutory uh, forestry strategy and um, a commitment towards sustainable forest management, but it, it doesn't radically shake up the way forestry is managed. Hopefully that will be done by the policy that is implemented by the Scottish Forestry Strategy, which is not covered within the legislation. John, do you want to develop that a bit? Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, it's a, a, a question specifically for Mr Crosby, and that's about the concerns about the separation of FCS and FES. Um, can you outline your concerns on that, please? Yes. Uh, I mean, I've worked for the Commission for 37 years, and that's my whole process has been about integration, um, working with the, um, the, the, what we call the Forestry Commission as opposed to the enterprise. Um, you know, I work with colleagues on that, um, which then feeds into the work that I do currently on renewables. <clears throat> you know, things like the um, the the uh, stopping wind farms from felling um, too much. Um, you know, the, the debate earlier on uh, was about um, you know, forest land and non-forest land. The whole point of forestry is to bring all these things together. Um, you know, the staff bring these things together. The, um, the work that goes on between the policy people, the delivery people, and the, uh, and the, the regulatory people is what makes it work. It's that integration of the staff, the, the partnerships, that, that, and the understanding, the knowledge of each other, where we're coming from, what we do, that makes the Forestry Commission successful. And if you split these off into two separate things, it won't happen overnight. Just gradually, you know, people will drift off. Scottish Government, you know, has a slightly different agenda. Forest Enterprise has a slightly different agenda. You just get that gradual moving apart, and it, it's, it's not going to deliver what the Forestry Bill wants it to. I wonder, do other panel members share that, that concern? Uh, yes, I, I think um, it's not an excuse. It's not a very good excuse, but we didn't really major on structure in our um, submission, um, partly because we got the feeling that this was a done deal. Uh, we met civil servants more than 18 months ago, and their parting shot to us was, why worry about Forestry Commission being wrapped in the arms of Victoria Quay? And in, in terms of an example, I think you would look at Wales and see what has gone badly wrong with forestry, where um, it, it's not worked in terms of a, a change. And from our point of view, and by our, I mean the community, small-scale um, environmental groups that we represent, Forestry Commission was the only government department that listened. ARPAD certainly don't, SEPA very rarely, SNH fairly toothless. The, the Forestry Commission changed the way that they worked because of their status and the way that they took um, advice, if you like. They had advisory groups, Native Woodland Advisory Group, the community, uh, Forestry for People Advisory Group, uh, we, we, Forest Policy Group, were set up uh, as, a, as, a, as an adjunct, if you like, to these advisory groups. And we do not see the Scottish Government being listening and flexible in a way that the Forestry Commission have done over the last 20 or 30 years. There's no other department you can look at that would have achieved the, the, the same object, the same outputs and outcomes for communities and for, forest, uh, for land management. Charles, do you share that view? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we, the Woodland Trust made no bones about the, the fuss we made about the, the consultation and the change to the structure. Uh, like Willie, I think we felt the uh, Forestry Commission Scotland, that forestry authority side, the regulatory and policy side, 
uh, was one of the best functioning public bodies in Scotland, uh, and I would trust the FCS to deliver on biodiversity targets or implementation of the land use strategy far more than many other areas uh, within Scottish public life. And the, our concern through this change was not only are you robbing Scotland of a standalone uh, forestry policy and regulatory body and the kudos that comes with that by bringing it in-house alongside everything else the Scottish Government does, uh, but you're, um, you're opening it up to that possibility of diluting the expertise within the organisation, which I'm sure we will touch on later. Okay, that's uh, three sort of opinions quite clear. Maggie, do you, do you have a view on that? And then I'd like to come to you, David, if I may. Our, our view is uh, quite simi similar. Um, Link did have concerns and there were with the same thing about regula regulatory and policy functions. Um, and and uh, we'll probably touch on expertise because we did, I don't know if you're going to move on to that, but it's about maintaining that. And it might be okay for the first few years, but 10 years, 20 years down the line, will it still be the same? Will we still have the foresters in the Scottish Government as civil servants? And also, um, the bill talks about sustainable forest management is about getting the, the balance right and as, as is sustainable development between economic concern economic interests social interests and environmental interests and it may become more of a um, political we, we see there's a risk that, be, that those decisions may be become more political if it's taken in to the government as a directorate rather than sort of more at arm's length david do you want to my comment was going to reflect on our experience when constructing the research agendas with Scottish Government and across a diversity of different policy groups and the cameras partners of which Forest Commission is one. And the comment would be that we found um, access and the horizontal connections very good in general terms with no doubt some specific issues. And the observation would be made then that this could be part of bringing the good reputation and evidence that colleagues here have just referred to of Forestry Commission in its openness and approachability from communities and industry um, into other parts of government and uh, part of the evolution of regulation and, and people. Um, so, David, that seems like a positive spin to the, to, the, to the concerns of the others. John, do you want to follow that up? Um, yes, yes, indeed, uh, uh, Convener, thank you. Uh, you know, given the concerns that have been voiced, would, would um, official recognition of the role of forester by the civil service, would having a chief forester sway any of your concerns? Um, all the hands going up. Um, <laughs> I'm going to bring Charles in first and then Malcolm. So you don't need to touch it, the, touch the, the sand man. Um, yes, yes, they would. Uh, our submission makes reference to both those things. Um, Maintaining that expertise within the organisation is very important and recognising the role of a trained forester and uh, ring fencing roles such as chief forester, uh, heads of divisions, um, the uh, conservators within each, uh, each area of the organisation as trained foresters would do a lot for maintaining that, uh, that element. In response to uh, Mr Green's question to the earlier session about an example of losing expertise. Um, I would point to when the Royal Commission on Ancient and Historic Monuments was merged with Historic Scotland. A unit was set up within the Scottish Government to work on policy. Uh, so I'll consider that uh, an uh, analogous to uh, a division within the Scottish Government. Uh, one year after that merger, the staff within that had been scattered to the four winds across the culture division, filling in gaps here and there. I appreciate it would probably be more difficult to do that with forestry, given its dominance uh, uh, within the government, but it's still a concrete example of how, once you're in Victoria Quay, you can start getting uh, distracted unless there is some security and ring fencing of the organisation. Uh, I'm going to bring Malcolm in and then maybe I could ask uh, John to widen, widen that question about Malcolm. Mm. Um, there is, the difficulty is if you split it up, it's not going to work to our mind. So our, our paper, our um, recommendation is that it should be retained as one piece. If you do split it up, you do need something to head it. Um, head of forestry 
It's difficult. I was talking to one of my colleagues just yesterday who is a health advisor who has come from the NHS. So, you know, we have brought in to forestry all these other skills. We've got an education advisor who was a teacher. You know, we've ha we had somebody who, who looked after drug rehabilitation offenders in Glasgow who came from the social sector. They've come into the Forestry Commission. So we call these forestry, but they're not. You know, the, the, the ministers, the officials have sort of said, yes, we'll, we'll recognise forestry <laughs> as a profession in the government. We're much, much more than that. Our staff do the whole range of stuff. We've got all these experts and we bring them in. They pick up the culture that we've got within this organisation, as a can-do organisation, that delivers things on behalf of the, the, the policy makers. That's how we succeed. If you split them up, you're just gradually going to get that disintegration. People are proud to work for the Forestry Commission. John, do you want yeah, to well, Thank you, Commissioner. Well, could <coughs> anything be included in or alongside the bill to reassure that uh, the new organisation is fit for purpose? As Maggie, can I, can I bring you in on that? Um, well, I was quite taken with what um, Peter Peacock said in um, his last evidence, and that might, because if we're going to have it like that, and it appears that's the direction we're going, then you do need the checks and balances in place. And some of the structures that come with the Forestry Commission, as it, as it is, like the National Committee for Scotland, which has an advisory role, and then you have the regional forestry form, forums who you took evidence from, it's what going, what's going to happen to those um, in the future. Um, and then, of course, you get the annual reporting and, uh, and planting and restocking targets, and that goes and the um, financial accounts, which go to the Parliament, um, and they can be scrutinised. And is that level of scrutiny is that still going to happen when it becomes a directorate of the Scottish Government? Um, Willie, do you want to come in, and then David, I'll bring you in if you'd like to come in as well. Yes, I think. Uh, that, that I would reinforce that that point that um, part of the strength of the Commission structure as it is at the moment is this um, uh, answerability to a national committee and the, when I talked in my first comment about stakeholders, the Forestry Commission has consistently listened through regional fora and we would want that to be maintained and not to be told, well, it will appear in some piece of policy later down the line. If it's in the statute, if it's in the bill, that, the, that what, whatever comes next has to have an advisory committee, like a national committee, and that we would maintain these uh, listening groups um, and, uh, in, in terms of the regional fora. That would, be, that would be a great step forward. David, do you want to add anything to that? I, one quick observation about <clears throat> the sorts of fora that um, have been referred to is that there are new ones uh, emerging, and, and part of that could include the land use strategies expectation of um, the regional land use partnerships. Um, where do these fit into the governance structures of holding to account, but also exploring visions? And uh, it's just another complication, but it needs work through. Thank you. Uh, the next theme, uh, Richard. Uh, Thank you, convener. Um, if I can go back to the theme from the first panel. Uh, in regards to forestry functions, and I know the Woodlands Trust and SE Link uh, have written in in regards to these, but particularly Woodlands Trust suggested that a, a duty to promote sustainable forestry management should be placed not just on ministers but also in the public bodies and private landlords, uh, landowners. Uh, do you agree? I'm sure you will, Charles. <laughs> Let me come in on that. <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure Maggie, Maggie Keehan will. Yes, also. I do agree with my point. Um, <laughs> the. <laughs> Not always, but uh, in this case, yes. Um, yes, I, th I think this is an example of what I was referring to in that very first <coughs> answer, that this is a workmanlike bill that does the job of transposing stuff. It's not, doesn't have great vision for the future of forestry, which I know the Scottish Government does. And if I can souk up for a minute, I I'd like to commend the, the Scottish Government for the, the role forestry plays in its new programme for government. I think it's, it's really a jewel in the crown of what Scotland does, and I'm glad to see it recognised as such. But, um, yeah, things, li things like... <laughs> sorry, apologies. No, uh, I but <laughs> th th things like that duty on sustainable forest management <sighs> is great, uh, but in terms of this legislation, it's only covering a small percentage of Scotland's forests. Um, if we wanted to be really radical, why not say that 
anyone that owns a forest has to manage it sustainably. That would be visionary. That's my point. Maggie, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, we would agree with that. I mean, obviously, the way that um, private owners manage the forests is uh, when they get the grant, then the UK forest standard kicks in, but that sort of kicks in for five, usually the five years um, when the grant is being delivered, but it's the intervening time, so things like um, deer management, which is part of sustainable forest management, <coughs> Um, you know, what it, it could help address that problem over um, making sure that the intervention, the time between the planting of the forest and the realisation of um, the um, commercial aspect of, it, of the timber production, that it's still been managed in a sustainable way. And, and that's kind of missing. And um, another thing to, uh, you know, native, native forests in Scotland are a very rare resource. And even the UK forest standard, there's only 5% that has to be required to be planted in a commercial forest plantation. And as we know, with the Scottish biodiversity strategy, um, we're not even hitting the targets of 3,000 to 5,000 plantings if you have native forests. So um, in terms of, uh, you know, our, um, in, in terms of this bill um, helping address other government objectives, it's not really, it, it could be doing more. David, do you... Yeah. I, I know that in, in most, or at least many, of the functions of our forests, the, the distinctions aren't really public and private except in terms of public goods. Um, and those might be their role as a carbon sink, um, biodiversity, um, landscapes. These sorts of functions are irrespective of who actually has title for that area. And so I think part of the, the direction of travel, which at least we interpreted um, as, as this indicating, is the role of forestry in the bigger picture of land in Scotland, and that the functions, therefore, need to be thought across about what we're looking for, rather than necessarily the distinctions of public and private, and that the, on the onus then would be on all aspects of land and all aspects of woodland had, had uh, at least shared the visions of where, what we're wanting from them. Uh, Malcolm, before I bring you in, Richard, do you want to widen that slightly? Yeah, there was also, you know, in the Woodlands Trust uh, went on about planting the, uh, afforestation, and you made a comment earlier on which I, I thought quite funny. Sweeties, uh, I'd be interested to know what this... I know you're doing a bit of shooking up, but I, I wonder what the, what the sweeties are. But anyway, can I go, uh, ask the, the question that the uh, convener wants me to ask? Do you... <laughs> Yeah, I do. <laughs> do you think there should be an additional provision in the bill relating to the forest uh, strategy or a commitment uh, to further planting? And I'm sure Charles will be, will be bursting to grow that one. But I'm going to let Malcolm come in first. <laughs> I just, just wanted to make a point about the difference between the public and the private sector. Um, a lot of frustration, if you like, with being in the regulatory sector is that you are only able to persuade people to do it you are relying on grants and incentives and encouragement. The National Forest Estate is about delivering it, and you know, we use that, that support from ministers to do it. So you know, much as we might like the private sector to do it, if you're going to do it, you need to have money. If you want people to, to do it, you've got to pay for them. OK. Willie, do you want to come in, and then I'll bring in Charles. Uh, yeah, it was really back to the comment from David. Um, um, those of us who swim in the sea of forestry uh, draw a very clear distinction between public benefits that arise from um, the public estate and private sector. Malcolm has just alluded to the, the mechanism by which public goods are derived from the private sector. And um, so in, in, in respect how you view it and how you view ownership, um, I would suggest that um, in the main, where you have public estate or you have something like common ownership and the common good, that um, there is an underlying commitment already in there to achieving sustainable forest management with all its public benefits, whereas in the private sector that's not necessarily the case. Charles. Um, yes, the, the issue of a forest station, the 1967 Forestry Act, the Westminster Act, that this is bringing over into Scottish legislation, is quite clear about one of the duties of the, the Forestry Commission is to plant more trees. And it was interesting in the previous session you had earlier this morning, um, there was some reticence amongst people to, to put that onto the face of the bill. They said, 
maybe at some point we're going to have enough trees in Scotland. And yeah, I, I raised a quizzical eyebrow at that point. I'm not sure uh, there will ever be a point where we will not have a need to be planting more trees in Scotland. What? Comment, a yeah. comment, in that particular comment. Absolutely, absolutely. But, but it, it, in terms of other things that are missing, I'll ma mention very briefly, um, deer management, uh, deer are woodland creatures. Um, the existing uh, Forest Enterprise Scotland is the biggest deer manager and most efficient deer manager in Scotland. Um, if we're talking about a duty to manage forestry sustainably, then deer is going to play a huge part in that in, in the coming years. So th this is a legislative vehicle which would give an opportunity to talk more about deer. I'm aware this committee may want to leave that entirely to uh, the Eclair Committee and Graham Day, but uh, we all have to pull together if we're going to tackle what is arguably the biggest threat to woodland in Scotland, even bigger than climate change. Claudia, do you want to come in on that before I bring in? Perfect opening, convener. Thank you. <laughs> and not just Graham Day, but the whole committee is, has profound, not to correct that, but has profound concerns about the issue of deer management. And, and that leads me to my question. And if people could answer briefly, that would be helpful. Um, uh, and it's really, there have been a lot of multiple benefits highlighted uh, by this panel and the previous panel. And I wonder the degree to which um, uh, this panel thinks that in section four, the preparation of the forestry strategy, whether there should be issues beyond climate change and um, reference to lands rights and responsibilities that should be added on the face of the bill, or indeed whether that it should be uh, perhaps at the start of the bill that all aspects of um, these multiple benefits should be um, taken into account throughout the issues in, in the bill. Who'd like to go first on that? Maggie. Um, well, the forestry strategy is going to be, the, you know, one of the most important documents because obviously it's going to direct um, ministers in promoting sustainable forest management. So it's an incredibly important document that's going to come out. And obviously, like others have said, we believe there should be wide consultation on that and it should be, you know, it should go to committees and it should go to parliament and obviously that isn't on this bill at the moment. Um, so, so that's one point to make. But I would also say that, yes, I'd agree with you that some of the, I mean, it, it only mentions with reference to, um, you know, with regard to the land use strategy and the land rights and responsibility statement. And of course, it will impact on so many other things. And in the policy memorandum, it does say that these are already recognised, but actually, you know, five years down the line, who's going to look at the policy memorandum? Nobody's going to look at that. You need to see these things on the face of the bill to show that they're important and how they're all integrated. And then we might start to get land use and public goods integrated because this can deliver so much more. It should be delivering the Nature Conservation Act. Willie, wide consultation on the forest strategy? Absolutely. Um, yes. And I would like to... Um, endorse what Maggie's just said. Um, the, the, the purpose of the strategy should be to deliver across Scottish government um, objectives. Um, and, and, and just since we're on the strategy, uh, I heard in the last session the, the figure of the five years in terms of reporting. Um, one of the positives to come out of DEER legislation is that because there's a requirement to report, um, it has remained quite high on the, in the, uh, uh, on the government's agenda and we would wish to see either three or five yearly reporting on the, the, the Scottish Forest Strategy. Charles, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, I, no, I would certainly agree that um, policy integration with all the other strategies that the Scottish Government have, um, not least the um, Scottish planning policy or Scottish economic strategy, uh, all have to be integrated with the forestry strategy. Um, it would do no harm to have them expressly 
uh, mentioned on the face of the bill. Uh, whenever you raise that, and I've the experience of previous bills trying to, to get policy integration there on the face of the legislation, uh, the answer is always given by civil servants that that's happening anyway. Uh, the Scottish Government works in a very joined up way. Um, if, if so, then you've nothing to fear from putting it onto the face of the bill. Uh, so I would, I would Just, agree with my colleagues on uh, that. Do you agree the strategy should be consulted on? Sorry, oh, oh ab no, absolutely. I mean, uh, we have benefited massively from having a Scottish <coughs> forestry strategy uh, for over the last uh, 15 or so years. Uh, what we have suffered from, I will say, is not having it updated over the last decade. Uh, I would argue that anyone that looks at this, this document from uh, 2006, they'll, you know, Willie and other foresters will look at it and recognise good forestry practice, but it does not reflect good policy integration with the rest of, of what the Scottish Government says. It even says Scottish Executive at the top. That's how old this is. Um, uh, so uh, we, not only should it be consulted on, but I would recommend that it's done on a five-yearly basis rather than every 10 years. Malcolm. Um, we consult on practically everything else. So I don't see why we shouldn't consult on the forestry strategy. Our land management plans go out to widespread consultation. Our strategic plans go out to widespread consultation. We have nothing to fear. That is what we do. We listen to people and we, we develop agendas accordingly. David. So, <clears throat> yes, the function should be up front uh, for contextual reasons. Um, clearly no reason to argue against it being consulted on in the most effective ways. Um, what I might add to that discussion is what the boundaries of such a strategy might look like um, geographically. Uh, so, do those boundaries uh, consider the strategy for the immediate non-forest land and the prospects of the evolution of the land which is under uh, prospective management? So, does that strategy uh, for land uh, include consideration of what's not currently forested, what could be added, and, and where it might explore the aspirations set out for the multiple benefits. Um, David, you're going to get me kicked very shortly by, by the Deputy Convener, who's just going to come on to that subject, oh, okay. I fear. So, uh, <laughs> Claudia, if, you, if, if the answers are sufficient, I'd like Thank to move much, on yes. to uh, the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Thank you. Good morning. Um, yes. Are you clear about the differences between forestry land and other land, and are any changes needed? As David, I cut you off in uh, <laughs> full spray. Are, are you clear in the, in, in the differences? <clears throat> well, I think it, th there are opportunities. There's clearly already known forested land within the, uh, the area of the estate. Um, the question seems to me to be what the uh, opportunities that are set out of obtaining of land, of purchase, of um, replacement, and whether you build that into forward thinking. <clears throat> Um, and where the boundary I was heading to is, is, is where fair forest land intersects with um, our urban environment. What's the, the link between trees and green infrastructure, which fits in with planning policy, as mentioned earlier? Um, and where will forestry be part of the local awareness of, of, our, of our cities and urban population? So the strategy geographically, I think, should be considering where there is um, plans or aspirations for the non-forest land, and then think through what the implications of that might be, which could be considerable. Maggie, do you want to...? Um, I'm clearer now because I've heard all the evidence sessions. Um, I've been sitting listening on my laptop at work to them. <laughs> I'm a lot clearer than I was. Um, having said that, what isn't clear is um, if land that is other land um, is soon to be planted up with trees if it's unsuitable. So if it's like deep peat, you know, blanket bog, does, is that still, is, and that can be managed for sustainable development? Or, I mean, I'm sure we'll come on to that, but I, I think some more clarity in the bill will help people and in the future when we're not having these debates. Um, okay, Malcolm. I think it's an entirely artificial dichotomy, which is completely unnecessary. Um, the, um, the, as I said about strategies which we consult on, we have wind farms which I spend my time making sure that they're keyhold rather than felling large areas so that they become genuinely part of the forest. <coughs> we have peat bogs which we manage, we do deforestation if it's not appropriate. Um, 
We have, um, you know, we talked about the urban area. One of the biggest initiatives we've had over the last 10 years is woodlands in and around towns, which is precisely to move us into the urban areas. Now, this is about bringing the benefits of woodland to those who live in urban areas and making sure that we are working in those areas where the, mass, the vast majority of people live. The work we did in Glasgow with um, uh, Drum Chapel and, and Easter House has just been fantastic. And the transformation of these communities as a result of what we've done. So, decide, I mean, the, the non-forestry definition is coming from this forestry and land bit and the concern that whether we might be bringing in and land and it might not be forestry. We manage lots of bits which don't have trees on. We don't, you know, we consult, so we don't go and plant up peat bogs. Yes, we did in the past. We've learned from our mistakes. We now go out and consult. We don't do that. So the, the, the issue of non-forestry, non to me, is entirely artificial. And it just, it should be part of our strategies that we, we work with the relevant experts to look after the land, land in the best way. Charles? Uh, yeah, I, th I think... It it can't be disputed that it is inelegantly drafted here, and certainly as previous sessions have uh, shown, it does cause confusion. I think one of, I think a possible solution to that confusion is where the bill refers to forestry land. It essentially means the national forest estate, uh, and if it was to use that terminology, things might be clearer. Um, although the concern, certainly amongst environmentalists, is that if you have land which exists within the National Forest Estate but is not forested, you are then putting a duty on that land to be managed according to sustainable forestry management. And some environmentalists read that as it will be planted up with trees, which will not necessarily be appropriate. However, the definition of sustainable forestry management, which is the Helsinki definition, which is in the policy memorandum, um, the final line of that is that a key element of sustainable forest management is that it is not done to the detriment of other ecosystems. Uh, therefore, I think you've got a, 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 a check and balance in there that will prevent um, our, our, my colleagues being worried that there is a march towards a forestation of every uh, square inch of Scotland, which I'm sure none of us want to see. Willie, do you have a... Uh, well, Brady wants to come in, and then maybe Willie can get a chance to answer. Just a wee question on that, Zim. Forestry land is actually the National Forest Estate. I mean, given that time will elapse from now, from the bill go, going forward, do you think that, that definition will continue? I mean, I, I would have thought that there is a clear definition difference between the land held by the Forestry Commission, and that's what's trying to, that's what the bill's trying to to point out, that they will hold non-forestry land as well. Yeah, I'll let you come back and then I'm going to bring Willie in, if I may. Well, on that, I, th I think it was maybe Confor that in a previous session suggested that a, a very elegant solution would be to dis define forestry land as land that has forest uh, trees on it and other land as, as the, everything else. Uh, that would solve that problem, from my point of view. Malcolm, you're shaking your head, so I'll let Willie come in if he wants no, to, and I then come back to I you, I Malcolm. I, I don't really have very strong views okay. on it. I think the other land, I, I would agree, has been brought in there, uh, just because there is land that's held by the Forestry Commission or for the National Forest Estate. I don't think there's any intention to do anything like okay. our forest it. So. Okay, so Malcolm, uh, and then Maggie, very briefly, if I could ask you. But. My previous role before I went into renewables was forest planning, which is the whole point is to bring everything together so that your plan includes everything. So all the land that is not planted is equally important in that land as anything that's got trees on it. If you try and distinguish that, it just becomes impossible. Mm -hmm. Maggie. Uh, just a couple of quick points, because forestry land is the activity of forestry, not the forest itself. Um, so, so that is the potential that it might become forestry, even though it may not. And also um, that we're, we're looking at through the lens of we have the Forestry Commission now as the advisors and about getting the balance right in 10 years' time if we're in to, if it's subsumed into the directorate of, you know, the Scottish Government, um, then there, there, may, there may be different priorities. And obviously, um, with trying to obtain targets which are quite difficult to reach, then other lands 
you know, there is a risk that other land becomes forestry land. There's no doubt about that. Thank okay. you. I'm going to move on, if I may, to John to introduce the next thing. Thank you. It's continuing with the management of land and particularly section 13, a further sustainable development. I quite like to have to say, I think it was a, your quote, Mr. McGee, I think, I don't know if you're quoting somebody else, when you say that sustainable development has been described as the slipperiest piece of soap you'll find in the bathtub. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested to know what uh, thoughts people have around section 13 and uh, the management of land for sustainable development. I'll let you uh, grasp that knotty problem, I think, Willie. It wasn't my expression, but um, I was uh, f fully behind it. Yes, I mean, what, what, we were trying to, what, what we were trying to do was to say that when you use expressions like that, it's, it's, it comes back to the forest strategy. You can put as, as many of these expressions in as you want, but to actually see uh, tangible results coming out the other end um, in the spirit of what you mean, the sustainable forest management or sustainable development is, is a bit more tricky. So what we were trying to do was to say that um, if, if we had um, a commitment to manage, as I mentioned earlier, where you were attempting to use forestry for rural development, um, combined with good environmental practice, um, um, furthering recreation, uh, all these different um, aspects which are included in other government strategies, then you'd be getting somewhere towards grasping that slippery piece of soap. Charles. Yeah, uh, well, my understanding of, of Section 13 is that if you are going to have this big, um, dare I say, monolithic um, agency that will manage in, in the future, all of Scotland's uh, publicly owned land, then you will need some sort of principle on which it will manage land that is not forestry. Uh, so they've uh, chosen sustainable development, which uh, makes sense. Uh, in terms of defining sustainable de uh, development, uh, I mean, we've been through the battles of the, the Land Reform uh, Act last year. Uh, I think the, the Brundtland definition of sustainable development is well recognised and commonly used within the Scottish Government. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm relaxed that that does what it intends to do. Malcolm. Well, again, I come at risk of repeating myself, it's all about integrating. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, I, I worked through with the Forestry Commission side of things on um, you know, the, the woodland removal policy, so that that was integrated. Sustainable, sustainable development is what we do. We've now got 1,000 megawatts of, of installed capacity on the National Forest Estates, wind and hydro. Um, you know, that's sustainable development, but we integrate it into the forest. Um, yes, you know, if somebody wants us to manage something else, the earlier session today, somebody mentioned about the risk of we might end up by managing natural na national nature reserves. We already manage a large number of SSSIs, lots of which are not forestry SSSIs. You know, we already manage these things. That's what we do. We bring in the necessary experts. If we're not, you know, if we're not the, the relevant authorities because we've been trained as silver culturalists, we bring people in and they become part of our culture. Then it's, it's going too far to have two separate phrases there, sustainable forest management and sustainable development. Should we be trying to come, come up with one? I wouldn't pretend to be an expert on legal definitions of things. And you know, I know a lot of more people here know far more about other bills and how they affect these things than me. I just know that we, as, a, as a, an organisation, work with ministers to deliver what they ask us to do. And that, to me, is what our purpose is. Okay, thanks. Maggie, are you relaxed about sustainable development? Um, well, I think I know what it is. Um, but uh, what I would say is that I think Link has probably given up on asking for the definition of sustainable development on bills because um, the same <coughs> arguments are trotted out. So as long as everybody is clear of what it means, then I think we should leave it at that. I, I suppose it depends what top trumps the sustainable development top trump. Um, sustainable forest management, but both of them about balancing the economic, social and environmental interests. That's what they're both about. And I suppose from our point of view, if we're looking at other land which is to be managed for sustainable development, 
is eco-housing sustainable development and could that be planted in say native woodlands which would which then i mean you know that's probably not it might happen um in the future um and which, which who would decide um would it be ministers who would decide that that should um go ahead or would it be a planning authority because we're talking about um houses um so it's not clear how how that's these sort of decisions are going to be determined. Okay, David. Comment on um, the sustainable development. After all, just by coincidence, um, next month is the 30th anniversary of the Brundtland Report. So the definition um, of that report is uh, still contemporary and still the underpinning of most of the rest. I, I'm not entirely certain of my ground here, but I would have thought that Brundtland and then following Rio Summit was part of the underpinning of what evolved into the National Forest Standard and best practice from Forest Commission. So I would have thought that sustainable development is the um, picture within which the sustainable management of forests is one element. And people um, are a core part of that. But the thing that I would bring to attention perhaps is that while thinking about what we want for the land, we should at least give consideration to the pathways to change. So. What we mustn't do is cut off our options by a decision which was poor or ill-considered or short-term when, as naturally our trees demonstrate, the, the game plan here is 50, 100 and several hundred years down the line. So sustainable development has to be taken in the long term. We need to think through the strat joining up the thinking of what we want with a strategy with the land that is currently trees and the land that is not and where these will change between each other. Not all land will remain in trees, as we found with the uh, flow countries, and other land will become wooded. So I would go with sustainable development and sustainable forestry as part of that. So can I just find that and ask? So Are you saying that th there would be a danger in a, a tight definition of sustainable development because in a few years' time we'd be needing to change it again? Well, I, would, I think the, the definition of sustainable development I would, I would keep, the, the, that Brundtland one, and then it's how we refine it and tag it for realities in, in, in our landscape. Um, that we've got the evidence of where we've changed our mind and therefore changed policy um, because other pictures, or bigger pictures have become apparent. I think what I'm really trying to say is that there are certain aspects which might be slightly more sectoral, whatever the sector, that may on occasions be shorter term and that those could head off or um, corral some of our activities and, and mean that we're, our options aren't as flexible into the future. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm going to leave that there and ask Mike to lead off on the next one. Thank you, um, I'd like to focus on compulsory purchase and um, we're told this bill transfers not just the powers of ministers from the 67 Act but actually increases them, develops them um, and we're also being told in evidence that these powers have never been used in the half century since the 1967 Act. So really what I'd like to know from you, I know of some of your submissions, but um, today, in today's evidence, what are the panel's views on the compulsory purchase powers in the bill and are they required at all? Who'd like to lead off on that? Charles, you, you were, your evidence is clear, I think, but I'd, I'd like to hear. And I agree with my evidence. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, no, I, I think for us, I think a lot of fuss is being made about this, uh, partially because I consider a huge amount of these powers to be duplication of powers that Scottish ministers already have. Therefore, it's almost irrelevant as to whether they take them here or transfer them over. But on, in terms of principle, um, the fact that they have not been exercised in, in several generations uh, would suggest that there is no cause to have them. And therefore, if I was Cabinet Secretary, I would consider it a great PR opportunity to say, look at me, I'm turning down powers that I could have. Uh, but I'm not Cabinet Secretary, so I will... Indeed, indeed, it would be refreshing and, and, and useful. But no, I, I don't see any reason why, uh, why these powers need to be transferred. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not least because those powers are replicated in, in other legislation already, uh, particularly in terms of sustainable development. That's what the, the Land Reform Bill uh, gave compulsory purchase order uh, powers to uh, manage land in a sustainably developed way. 
Charles, first you praise him and then you say he wants his job. Uh, so, Willie, perhaps you'd like to, to come back on that, anything there. I think there's one point in what Charles said that I would agree with him, and that is that um, it, it's a facet of rolling powers over from the 67 Act. So I, I'm, I'm not sure that it was ever in there in, t intended to work um, in the way that our previous panel um, ha were fearful of. Um, there seemed to be a great deal of, of kind of unrest about it. I'm a little bit more sanguine than Charles. I think if I was a cabinet secretary, even though I didn't use the, the, the tool in the toolbox, I would quite like to have it there just in case. Um, I, I think there's quite a lot of fuss for a relatively innocuous um, line. Um, Malcolm, do you want to? Very briefly, I mean, our style is to try and work in consensus. <clears throat> it doesn't really make much difference to us whether the, it's in the bill or not. We don't want to use it because we would much rather work by working with people. Okay. Uh, David, do you want to, to come in? Uh, Maggie, do you? I think uh, the Lynx view was the same as the Woodland Trust. And if, if, the, if it's going to be um, retained in the bill, then there need to be protocols and guidance put in place to, um, to make sure that the power is not abused in the future. OK. Uh, Mike, do you want to come back? Uh, I, I've just got a question, if I may, on d disposal of land. I mean, the current policy, as far as the forest estate, is that land can be disposed of. I think it's called rationalisation and, and reorganisation of the forest estate, um, providing land is purchased to replace it. Um, that's the parliamentary uh, position. I'm not sure that's the way it's been interpreted. Uh, are you happy that forest estates should be, should be sold off, or do you think there should still be that caveat on it? <laughs> Maybe I could just ask Willie to start, and then Malcolm, I, I can see you're all sort of thinking about answers. So... Maybe we'll start on the left this time, or my left. David, do you want to start then? Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, um, rotating, and sorry, I don't mean rotating in a forestry sense, I mean actually um, the way in which our land is used. There are going to be, into the future, given the time horizons we look at for trees, the climate change is going to mean that some areas are better or worse for considering certain types of land use. They will be better or less are well suited. Um, there may be then new opportunities for certain crops to be grown, and I mean here tree crops as well, in certain areas, and therefore there might be other areas you want to relinquish because, in fact, we're not gaining any benefit in particular. It may not be quite as extreme as a flow country example, but there may be other areas where uh, the, the presence of trees is not contributing significantly. But that might be well down the line. It could be decades down the line. But if this is setting up the framework for this, then that rotation of land and land use in and out of a particular use would seem to be both sensible and astute planning. Uh, sorry, I should have perhaps made myself clear. I understand the rotational use of land. What I was trying to ascertain is whether you'd be comfortable with the forest estate reducing in, in size... Uh, by disposal of land. Um, perhaps mm -hmm. Maggie, would, 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 do you have a view on that? Well, we believe it should be a transparent process, but what they should do is, with the money, it should be reinvested for the people in, of Scotland into outstanding mm -hmm. examples of forests, either by acquisition or creation. Um, it shouldn't just be subsumed into government coffers. It should actually... You know, we don't want to see the forest estate diminish in size if there are places where it could be expanded. So that's how we want to see a careful disposal and reacquisition. Malcolm, there's several types of acquisition. Uh, sorry, disposals. Uh, uh, there are um, what we call repositioning ones, and there's rationalisation. Um, and unfortunately, um, a lot of these have an impact on our members. Um, you know, if you sell off more of the estate, we've got less work. Um, Things get put out to, you know, to, to contract and that. And this is not in the interest of our members. Now, um, the, the repositioning one, which I think is the one you're talking about, where the, site, the money is recycled into uh, to buying new land, you know, it, it diminishes the size of the estate because, in general, we're selling off um, things which are cheaper because they're less attractive and we're buying more expensive land and then we've got to pay to plant if, they, if that's what the case um, the difficulty is, you know, with any organisation which then reviews its management structures and its, its, its office structures and its, its um, delivery uh, mechanisms, is that you keep on, if you keep on 
shrinking the numbers of, of offices, then more and more of the forest gets further away from the office and more difficult to manage. So, you know, the, uh, there has no doubt been um, a lot of disposals which have led to our loss of jobs, uh, which is certainly not in our interests as union representatives, um, and it has diminished the size of the estate, and it's diminished what we can do because we have now moved out of large areas where, you know, um, Willie particularly, you know, and, and uh, Charles would really want us to be working with communities. Um, and we no longer have these connections um, because of disposals. Um, so the, 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 the repositioning means that our estate is shrinking. Charles. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've just been through a round of repositioning, or as it's been rechristened, um, new new woodland investment is, is what it's called but it's, it's basically selling off some land to create money so the, the most recent round was inspired by the snp manifesto pledge to plant up x acres of a uh, former open cast mine uh, and turn that into to forestry but to get the money to do that the forestry commission are having to uh, dispose of some some uh, sites we've worked with uh, forest enterprise to try and make sure the formula they use to work out which sites they're going to select um, protects the, the most important woodland that we feel needs to be maintained within the public um, ownership to ensure that it's protected best. Um, there are certainly some sites that are in that this current round that we don't think should be being sold, should be think should be retained and protected by the state. The solution we have to that is conservation burdens, um, a legislative uh, device which would uh, be registered on the deeds of the, of the property and uh, transfer over that would ensure that the new owner had to maintain a certain level of ecological value on the site. Um, they haven't been used yet, and frankly, if they're not being used by our state to protect land, I don't know who else is going to use it. So the Woodland Trust will continue to try and ensure that uh, Forest Enterprise or its successor bodies will uh, start to put burdens on land as they dispose of them to ensure that they remain protected. Willie, do you, do you have a shorter addition to that? <laughs> Um, in principle, the, the Forest Policy Group um, sees nothing wrong with repositioning or new woodland investment. Um, we're uh, very conscious, Malcolm, of the capacity um, reduction within forest enterprise. I think a, a lot of it is in the detail. I think the, uh, the idea of selling uh, remote rural conifer blocks to fund land reclamation where private companies have gone bust or walked away from the responsibilities is not a tremendously good one, especially given the very high costs of, of reclamation and um, uh, the money needed. But we would see broadly forest enterprise as a mechanism for diversifying woodland ownership. So whether it was in partnership with, comp with communities, leasing to communities, you, you've talked about disposal, but actually the, the new um, the new object heaving over the horizon is, is lease. So um, it, it's quite feasible that in the, in the, in the near future or uh, at some point you're going to get big private companies wanting to come in and take on large elements of the state forest. And in that instance, we would be a lot more uncomfortable. More uncomfortable. More uncomfortable. Well, uh, it's not that per se the, the, the private company wouldn't manage it to a high standard um, and, and still provide public benefits, but that we would want it to have um, a, a degree of openness, transparency and consultation before anything like that happened. Thank you. Uh, Maggie, I'm afraid time is, is, is going to force me to, to ask Rada to lead into the next theme, please. Yes, can I ask about the definition of um, community in the bill and ask if you're content <coughs> with how this is, this is in the bill and if it sits with other legislation or if you're kind of in the same mind as our previous panel who thought all the part, the, the section 18, 19, 20 of the bill um, dealing with communities wasn't required because Scottish Government already had those powers. Willie. Yes, John Hollingdale's answer in the first session would broadly um, mirror our views. So there's many things in the bill that we think, like 
Charles's comment about um, acquisition um, and compulsory purchase, that b the definition of community is well phrased in other bills, and so we're, um, we're not hung up on seeing it defined again in this bill. Everyone's nodded at that stage and, and say, in, unless there's a complete diverging view, Rhoda, would you like to, is there a follow to that or are you? Well, just, I understand you, you're happy with the definition of community in the bill, but do you think it needs to be there at all, like the previous panel? Those sections um, allowing... I put it this way, I've seen a few people shake their head. So if anyone thinks it needs to be there, Charles, you obviously do, well, well, you can... No, I, I, I'm just attempting to clarify that uh, it's the fact that it doesn't need to be there that we agree with. Oh, right. Sorry. Uh, therefore, the definition is caught up in the previous legislation, so, or the three definitions in the previous legislation. The, sorry, Maggie. I would just say, as long as they're consistent, consistent across bills so that everybody knows what a community is, that's the point mm -hmm. that we need. Malcolm, you Very briefly, we have used the NFLS definition. We've moved to the CATS definition to be satisfactory. Thank you. Ready? Are you I'm happy with that. Um, Fulton, can I ask you to go on the next one? Yeah. Uh, as I asked the, the previous panel as well, I'm, I'm going to ask the panel about your views on failing and if the provisions in, in this bill are an improvement on the, the Forestry Act or if there's anything missing from the bill or something there that, that shouldn't be. Um, happy to hear your views on that. I'm sort of looking round. Malcolm, do you want to...? Well, I, I don't claim to be an expert on filling provisions um, within uh, you know, the, the conservancy side of things. Um, we deliver what we're required to do. Um, you know, as I say, I, I, whether they need to be in the Act or not and whether they need to be charged, I don't think it's for us to have a view on. Does, uh, Charles? Yeah, I have, a, I have a slightly hot take on this that is different from others. Um, I think that previously you, you heard a lot of people say uh, that they would like to see more detail in the bill. Uh, they're, they're not happy about the principle of moving things over into secondary legislation. Um, I, I, I would generally agree with that, but I would caveat it quite strongly with the fact that we have in the Woodland Trust experience of certain felling practice which could be described as taking advantage of a loophole within the 1967 Act. Um, and that was a, a loophole that there was no prospect of closing because it would require, require primary legislation at Westminster, uh, of which there was no prospect. Therefore, the moving of a lot of the detail about felling into secondary legislation gives an element of flexibility that certainly in this example we would have, would have delivered uh, better results for forestry uh, as an outcome. But that is just one example. Uh, I'm sorry, just to clarify that, because you, you've created an example, it, it, was that, as the, one example, one no, experience? No, no, a number of examples of the same practice. Well, and what was this? Well, this is, this is an example that you, within failing regulations, you're allowed to take out five cubic metres per quarter for your own yeah. use. Some, uh, I don't want to get everyone doing this now by advertising it, but if you, if you own a, 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 a forest and you want to clear fell an element for development, uh, if you subdivide your, your property into, between four different owners, you then have access to uh, 20 cubic metres. And if you do those in the corners of those four, um, you get one little unit. And if the next day is counted as the next quarter, then suddenly you've got 40 cubic metres uh, removed and you've essentially perfectly legally clear felled uh, site for development. Um, and obviously working with colleagues in, in the Forestry Commission, we've been able to uh, stamp down on that, but uh, it's, it's a loophole that exists within the current legislation and uh, we're working uh, with civil servants in the framing of this secondary legislation to try and close that up. Sounds a, a bit devious to me. I mean, Peter, do you want to, to follow on with that? Yeah, well, I mean, it, my question is about regulations and felling, and it's particular uh, the Scottish Environment Link, so it, it's, it's focused for, uh, firstly on, on yourself, Maggie. You seem to have some particular interest about Section 23 felling exemptions, and then you're also consider considerably worried about off-site compensatory planting. 
Can you explain your concerns about these, these issues? And uh, the, uh, once you've done that, do other members of the panel share your concerns? I, I think it's where, um, if, you, if you're required to, so we're trying to look at scenarios where it would be inappropriate to plant trees because, you know, there's some places where it, there's other ecosystems um, that, should be, that should remain in place. Um, so what we're thinking is, well, the, there may be occasions where if you are required to restock on other land, as it says, then how do you know that that land is suitable, is always going to be suitable for tree planting? And that was the point we wanted to make. Um, it was just the unintended consequences of one thing leading to another. Um, that might be a very low risk, but in bills you always have to look at unintended consequences. Okay. M Malcolm wants to just, I think you want to pick just up. Just very on quickly, I mean, in order to plant land, <clears throat> you need to have permission. And you've got to, that's got to go through the Conservancy and be approved. And, you know, if, if it is unsuitable because of, a, you know, another environmental priority, I think it would be highly unlikely it would get approved. Mm. Everybody else agree? Is that... It, 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 yeah, it, so, Maggie, Maggie your, it. Your, 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 con, your concerns are maybe not so, so uh, acute as you might think. Yeah, we're, yes, we're, we're always looking for unintended consequences, which are... <laughs> OK. Stuart, sorry, you... Um, Yes, the next section. Um, th this will be quite brief. Um, Charles uh, Dundas, you made reference to uh, registration of environmental uh, burdens in the registers of Scotland um, and, and said that was a good thing to do, although it wasn't happening. Now, the, the bill provides for registration of um, various... Uh, matters related to felling. Is that a general indication that you think the Registers of Scotland is the best place to uh, keep records uh, of obligations that there are associated with land? Or, as I think the balance of the evidence in the previous panel was, uh, that it could properly and adequately be provided simply through the website of uh, the Forestry Commission Scotland or its successors? Charles, I'll let you come, and then I think, Malcolm, I, I suspect you may have views on that, so, yeah, Charles. Yeah. Um, I, I will hold my hands up and say that when we read it in the bill, we, we thought register, the, the registers of Scotland seemed like the right place for it. I have to admit, I didn't think through the consequences, and listening to this morning's evidence, I'm, I'm now in two minds that perhaps, actually, it could easily be done through the Forestry Commission. It could certainly be done more cheaply. Um, uh, so... I'm, I wouldn't want to present myself as saying that we are absolutely tied to what's in the bill. If there was an alternative such as doing it through uh, Forestry Commission's existing IT system, then I would be quite happy to look at that. But as a matter of principle, it should be... Let's not necessarily use a capital R on the word registered, okay. but publicly so, available so, to be seen. Absolutely. As a principle, However a that is delivered. I agree. Yes. So, sorry, can we... Uh, Maybe Malcolm's got the experience of, of, of how that works at the moment, and maybe you could explain that, because I think the committee would find that very useful, because it, it seems to me a, quite a simple system. Malcolm. In the past, we used to have to send out a license to somebody if they wanted some data. Um, we have, as part of the open government approach, um, we have moved to publishing as much as possible as we can online. Um, the Forest Enterprise, for example, publishes its entire subcompartment database online, um, you can get it, you can access the site. As a developer, you want to look at it, you can do so. The Forestry Commission does exactly the same with all the constraints, so Woodland Grant Scheme, the, the, the old, um, you know, all, everything is there. It's unavailable on a public available website, which is maintained and updated by, I'm assuming, my colleagues in Forestry Commission Scotland. Other data, like SNH data, is brought in. You know, it, it's, it's just gathered into it one one repository where it's publicly available. Um, and I would also point out that Registers is quite busy at the moment. They have to register everything supposedly by 2019, which is an absolutely mammoth task, which will be very interesting to see if they achieve it. Malcolm, can I, can, can I just, sorry, I'll bring Stuart in if I may. Could you just explain, is it very easy to access that database? Yes. Yep, sorry, Stuart, you wanted to come back. Um, yeah, no, I'm, Maggie, I'm, right. Ma I'll, I'll make my point first, and then Maggie can pick it up if she needs to. Um, the, the, Malcolm used the phrase 
as much as possible. And I just slightly worry about that. Does that imply, therefore, that it would be helpful if the bill were to take a different approach from Registers of Scotland, that at least the bill should specify what information would have to be published so there'd be no ambiguity about the respective responsibilities of all the parties? I think any obligations need to be published. I mean, yeah. you know, if they're, if they're a constraint that we're aware of, I mean, obviously, there may be some things we're not aware of, which we can't be expected to sure, publish. Sure. But, I mean, that, that's, that our approach has just moved to open government. It costs us far less to put it on a website than to have somebody ring up and say, can you supply me with such oh, and yeah. such? And then somebody does the same thing the following day. That's why I did it with all the renewable stuff. Mm. Maggie, do you want to come in? It was just a very brief point with my Scottish Wildlife Trust hat on that we have planning volunteers who regularly use the excellent website and if this information was there as well it's all in one place I have to say I always found it quite easy Charles do you want to uh, no I agree that it's a very easy website to use I would recommend you all have a look does anyone... I may move on to the next theme then which is and the last theme which is Jamie uh, Green to introduce <coughs> thank you Gavina uh, I would like to close um, to discuss the financial implications of the bill uh, two short questions. Uh, I'll take them separately. The first one is uh, around the budget lines for uh, FCS and FES, which at the moment are separate and come with their respective separate uh, accounting, um, reporting and uh, audit uh, functions. One assumes that these will be subsumed within the, new, uh, within the uh, Forestry Directorate. I wonder if the panel had any uh, concerns around that, but more importantly, if they have concerns, what they think this bill should include to address any concerns that you have. Malcolm. <coughs> um, I strongly object to the proposals. I've made it very clear that we are, uh, feel that our staff will be greatly at risk if this structure that's proposed comes about. Um, officials have used in evidence sessions both with us when we've met the minister and the officials and with yourselves have used the the fact that we've got two separate sets of accounts as evidence that we're two separate organizations i hope i've been able to show this morning that we're not two separate organizations that we work very closely together and we just have accounting arrangements which demonstrate that we spend this bit on fcs and this bit on fes and we have you know audit appropriate um, if this is separated out, others have made comments that there is no then accountability on what the, the Scottish Government spends on the, the, the regulation and policy side. Um, you know, it, our, our case is entirely consistent that this needs to be a separate organisation which is fully accountable and fully um, transparent. And we would prefer it to be a single organisation with both parts in it. Maggie. I think you're putting the part that we raised. Um, and I suppose it's whether we can get a, whether we can think of some amendment that can go on the, the bill or whether we get a commitment when the minister is sitting before the committee next week to talk about um, assurances over how spe the spending will be scrutinised, how the parliament can scrutinise it. And I'm not quite sure how, as yet thinking about it, but we will think about it if it's something that can go on the bill. But in the meantime, you could ask the minister how you know, it's a valid point, and get it on the record as to uh, what his thinking is behind that. Because, um, as, as was raised in the, um, the previous session, in terms of the restructuring an organisation, if it takes away from optimising the asset of Scotland in terms of woodland creation, woodland restoration, native woodland creation, then we wouldn't want to see that. Even if it is a short term, it's probably going to be quite costly. Charles? Um, yeah, no, it's, it's a great irony that uh, a bill that sets out to try and increase accountability and transparency is through, I'm sure, an unintended consequence, removing uh, a great deal of transparency in terms of the, the funding going into these two uh, operations of Scottish Government. Um, in terms of how you actually fix that, I mean, it, it shouldn't be too difficult. It's about reporting and, uh, and accounting. Um, so our requirement on uh, the, this particular division to provide uh, a full accounts to Parliament, uh, uh, some, something along those lines. I haven't given uh, thought to that, but then that's, that's your guy's job. 
Willie, do you want to come in? Yeah, I would endorse um, Charles's point and, and, and Malcolm also in terms of the structure. I think, I don't know, I, you're not going to ask about IT and rebranding as a, a follow-up. Well, well why don't you, sorry, why don't you bring that in now, uh, Jamie, and then perhaps will you get a chance to answer that? Sure, I, I mean, it's, it's similar to what I asked the last yeah. panel. I mean, there was a bit of a mixed response, I think, the last panel as to how important this was. I mean, the cost could range from estimates between six and 12 million pounds. It's still a substantial amount of money, which uh, I get the impression will come from existing forestry budgets as opposed to new money that's been introduced by the Scottish Government. I want to hear if the panel thinks that uh, whether the Scottish Government should fund the cost of this restructuring, which at the end of the day is a political decision to do so. Short answer, yes. I think that, that IT, somebody mentioned ARPID, and, the, and there was a few of us sitting around the table that used these systems to get access to grant. I think they should not go anywhere near new IT. Um, and branding, rebranding over a number of years with the same livery, but perhaps a different play on the words would mean that you didn't have to spend a lot of money getting white vehicles or going around Scotland's forests, changing all the signs. So, uh. Sorry, can I, uh, I, mean, I mean, you are, you are, you, you are accepting rebranding. I mean, what we've heard this morning from, from people is the, the high esteem that the Forestry Commission Scotland is held in and how the fact it's fairly well integrated. So when, before just accepting rebranding, <laughs> okay. are you saying it needs rebranded or, or, or not? No, I would, I would not restructure or rebrand, but as a, a sometimes fatalist, um, uh, if it were to be the case that it, the, the decision was to do such a thing, then doing it in such a way to maintain the, the colours and, and, and word verbiage um, such that we're not spending four to whatever million pounds it is on, uh, which could be spent better elsewhere. Okay, as this seems to be a good, good way to wrap this up, I'm going to just go straight down the line, if I may, and give you all a chance to answer the question, does it need to be rebranded, and where should the money come if it does need to be rebranded? So, Charles, perhaps you can... Um, well, no, I would... Although I would never call myself a fatalist, I agree completely with Willie that... Um, a, yeah, our original position that this doesn't need to happen uh, it d does away with all of these, these issues. Uh, one of our initial responses to the consultation was that the Forestry Commission is such a strong brand uh, and has such a great reputation that it's a real loss to Scotland to lose it. Um, my understanding is, of course, that um, in England they will maintain the Forestry Commission brand. They will be Forestry Commission um, continuing, but then that makes me think that maybe we should adopt a, a sort of yes Scotland approach, uh, similar to what they, was, they said about the pound, is that it's, it's our forestry commission too and we've got just as much right to use that branding and continue along those lines, but uh, I, I've not heard any appetite for that approach uh, down the line. In terms of uh, taking a fatalistic approach and if it's, if it's thrust upon us and we have to do it, then um, I would not want to see any money transferred from operations on the ground into IT or new signs. If it detracts from putting one tree in the ground, then I think it's, it's done a disservice to Scotland. Yeah. Malcolm. Um, the process, as I understand it, is that the, the brand is owned by Forestry Commission and as such belongs with Westminster. Consequently, if you split off you don't have license to use the brand. Now, we are currently talking about what happens with forest research. We haven't asked in this particular panel, but the management of forest research looks as though it's going to end up by retaining, remaining as part of an agency of the Forestry Commission England, um, which will then end up by being able to use the brand in Scotland, because we have a, a branch of our research establishments at Northern Research Station just outside Edinburgh. So we're then proposing that the Forestry Commission in Scotland moves out of that. Um, if negotiations can take place about you know, the, the cross-border nature of forest research, I don't see it as being terribly difficult to come to some agreement about the use of the brand. I really can't imagine that Westminster is going to die in a ditch over it. Um, so I would say we have no need to, to change the brand. We could make some minimal changes. We've suggested here Forestry Scotland rather than Forestry Commission Scotland, a very minor change. Um, 
but it's about keeping the, the two parts together is the important thing. And on the, on the subject of the actual money, there is an element of IT investment that is required very definitely in the organisation um, with a lot of uncertainty around we have perhaps not spent as much as we should have done. So there is some investment required in IT. Moving to Scottish Government with their facilities that they already have could be of great benefit to us and that will require some investment. Um, but spending that much money on the rebranding is a complete waste of money and will not go down very well with um, your constituents. Um, so, and it is, you know, as others have said, it's a severe threat to our staff. The, the, the requirement is whoever divorces pays the bill. When Wales left, they had to pay the bill. When Scotland left, they have to pay the bill. But actually all they've done is they've transferred to the Forestry Commission and said, you pay for it. And that is a severe threat to our staff. Thank you, Malcolm. Maggie, could I ask you... Very brief, yes. Um, brief. I, I think that the main thing is... Um, that, as I said before, money shouldn't be diverted from the activity of forestry and, and delivering sustainable forest management through a new brand. And if we could keep the same name, it would save money. David. Um, <clears throat> I'll start with IT first and then brand, if you don't mind. Um, the comment I was going to make about IT was just that, although I understand why lots of um, reputations can be damaged by lots of things necessarily not working, but Looking forward, um, whatever the information technology that's going to be required, this will require continual reinvestment to be contemporary and leading edge for managing best parks of a fifth of Scotland's land, if you were to take all trees. Um, so what I'm saying is that we shouldn't, I think, uh, um, leave by reflecting on a lack of investment in what is going to be the underpinning infrastructure for the efficient management of the system and where it comes from um, uh, wouldn't be for me to, to pick up. Um, and on the branding, it seems to me that it is really important to try and keep the, the goodwill and the name and, and the colleagues here have expressed that really um, cogently. Um, the question in my mind is, given that we are touching on 100 years of the Commission, what, what should the brand be in 2117? with the generations going through? It, will it be that the generation coming up and using and benefiting from these forests will, be as, will associate with Forestry Commission or Forestry Commission Scotland in the same way? And I, I just wonder, the dialogue, the debate, the, the consultation could be what, what should that be for the current generation and that for the next 100 years? And again, the, the payment for that, I'll, I'll pass if you don't mind. Okay. Thank you very much, all of you, for the evidence that you've given this morning. I think it's been very interesting, and we, we've certainly learned a lot uh, on forestry, and, and the passion that you have spoken with actually has come through. So thank you very much. It, that actually does conclude uh, this part of the committee's business. Our next meeting uh, next week is on the Island Scotland Bill, and we'll be taking evidence from the Cabinet Secretary on Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill and the Small Holding Bill, and we'll be looking at a budget approach. But that concludes our meeting today, and I, will like, I would like now to close the meeting. I would ask committee members please to remain seated for briefly for a session afterwards. Thank you.